Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is consideration of business motion 15875 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Lobbying Scotland Bill. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now, please? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 15875, Minister. Formally moved. Thank you. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I will now put the question to the Chamber and the question is that motion number 15875, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 15874 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill. Um, I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to please press the request to speak button now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 15874, Minister. Moved. Thank you. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I will now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 15874 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The next item of business then is stage three proceedings on the Lobbying Scotland Bill. When dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at stage two, that is SP Bill 82A, the marshalled list, the supplement to the marshalled list and the groupings. A division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the proceedings. The period for voting for the division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. I'd be grateful if members could now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. And we turn to group one, lobbying definition, and I call amendment one in the name of Neil Finlay in a group on its own and ask Neil Finlay to move and speak to amendment one, please. Thanks, President Officer, and moving the amendment. I think this uh, bill is in danger of being undermined from the outset by a lack of definition of what we are actually talking about when we discuss lobbying. The bill, as it stands, has no clear definition and therefore leaves itself very exposed. Amendment 1 would uh, remedy this glaring loophole by providing a definition of what we mean by the term lobbying, and it strikes me rather absurd to introduce a bill without actually defining what lobbying is. I don't I think we introduce many bills in this Parliament without describing the actual thing that we are legislating for, but then again, not, logic does not necessarily apply in this place. Um, the definition that I have put forward is one that we consulted on and, um, and we took much comment on, and therefore I uh, would ask people to support the amendment. Thank you, Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I understand uh, the principle underlying uh, what Mr Finlay is seeking to do. I am, however, left uh, somewhat uh, unclear what the phrase in a professional capacity might mean, since that itself is not defined uh, within the bill uh, where we are to accept this uh, amendment. So I think while understanding where Mr Finlay is coming from, it seems to me much more effective for us to look at the activities that are covered by the bill, that is what the bill is about. The member will. Neil Finlay. I think the definition as given is much clearer than the lack of definition that we have at the moment. Does he not agree? Stuart Stevenson. Uh, well, of course, I don't agree that actually it carries with it the significant danger that it may exclude by putting things like in a professional capacity in the amendment uh, some of the intention of areas that we will regulate on. So I think we're simply safer to go on what's in the bill, the activities that are covered by the bill, and it's certainly my intention. Um, I, I think I won't. We'll make progress. Uh, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Very briefly, just to, to say in the, the defence of this amendment, it seems reasonable to include a definition uh, in, on the face of the bill. And I have to say that the idea that we've just heard that this amendment seems to include both too much definition and not enough definition seems uh, a rather weak and, and perplexing argument. Thank you. Uh, Minister. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as I think Neil, Neil Finlay described, the, the aim of Amendment 1 is to set out in the Bill a definition of what lobbying is before the Bill moves on to define the scope and the scope of regulated lobbying. As I made clear at Stage 2, this amendment is not required. Section 1 of the Bill already defines clearly what type of activity is deemed to be lobbying, the type of lobbyees and lobbyists to be included, and the means by which the lobbying communications are made. Mr Finlay's amendment would lead to confusion and potential difficulties of interpretation of the Bill's key provisions, including in particular Section 1. The effect of the amendment is likely to be the opposite of what Mr Finlay envisages. It would not add to clarity, but instead would create unnecessary ambiguity. For those reasons, I invite Parliament to oppose Amendment 1 in the name of Neil Finlay. Thank you. Neil Finlay, to wind up and indicate if you intend to press the withdrawal, please. Uh, I think as we go through the afternoon, uh, Mr uh, Fitzpatrick might care uh, to reflect on those words, to um, reflect on the, uh, the words confusion and ambiguity, because once we go through this bill, I think that's what this will be riddled with. Therefore, uh, I think we should uh, uh, move to the amendment and I press the amendment. Um, <coughs> sorry, in which case the, the question is that amendment one be agreed to, are we all agreed? Parliament has not agreed and uh, there will be a division and as this is the first division of the stage I now suspend Parliament for five minutes.
Order. We will now proceed with the division on amendment number one. This is a 30-second division. Members should please cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number one is yes, 30, no, 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That then brings us to group two, regulated lobbying methods of communication. And I call amendment 12 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, already grouped with amendments 15, 14 and 23. And I ask Patricia Ferguson to move amendment 12 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise to move amendments 12, 15 and 14 in my name and to support Amendment 23 in the name of George Adam. The Government's Bill Parliament has before it today suggests that only communications made orally, that is face-to-face -face communication or by video conference or the like, should be deemed to be lobbying. But in evidence to the Standards Committee, Dr Dinan of Spinwatch and Alter EU described the restriction to face-to-face -to -face communication as ludicrous while Unlock Democracy described the current definition as a gift to those who might wish to keep their activity out of the public gaze. Professor Raj Chari of Trinity College Dublin, an expert in this area, advised us that he was unaware of any le legislation anywhere else that contained such a restriction. Carers Trust Scotland presumed charitably that it might, must just be an oversight but no, presiding officer, it is not an oversight. It is instead the policy position of the Scottish Government. Now, as a result of the evidence it heard during stage one, the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, of which I'm a member, suggested that the Scottish Government should also consider including other forms of communication, such as emails, letters and telephone communication. At stage two, I brought forward amendments to the bill amendments designed to give effect to the stated recommendations of the majority of the Standards Committee, but unfortunately that committee then chose to vote down those amendments by five votes to one. So much for the independence of our committees. So today I again move amendments designed to ensure that communication by email, by telephone and in writing will be considered to be lobbying. Without these amendments, this bill becomes a sham. Yep, yep. But before members press their voting buttons, presiding officer, let me ask them to consider this. We have all been lobbied about this bill. We have been lobbied by a range of organisations with different viewpoints. How many of those organisations who lobbied us spoke to us face to face? And how many yeah. sent an email? I think we know the answer to that one. And we also know the power of electronic and written communication and to omit them from this bill is plain wrong. Thank you. I now call George Adam to speak to Amendment 23 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to talk on and move my Amendment 23. I bring forward this amendment in the back of a recent briefing paper from the Law Society of Scotland. The Law Society noted at Section 1 of the Bill to a communication which is made orally. The Bill does not define orally, and the Society further noted that the plain dictionary definition of orally makes reference to verbal communication. Like the Law Society, I would welcome clarification from the Government as to whether British Sign Language or indeed other forms of communication equivalent to the use of the spoken word would be covered by the Bill as currently drafted. 
During the passage of Mark Griffin's Members' Bill in British Sign Language, I, along with my colleagues in the Education Committee, learned that BSL is a living, thriving language within our community. And it is my belief that if we truly recognise BSL as a language, as the BSL Scotland Bill did, then it stands to reason that that language will be used to engage in the political process in ways that represents that community. So it is only logical that we include BSL in the lobbying bill as oral communication. This is a technical amendment, but it is one that keeps this Parliament's commitment to those who serve in the BSL community who look towards equality of communication. And with that in mind, President Officer, I would ask members to support this amendment. Thank you. At the moment, I have two requests to speak. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, if I may, uh, it was perfectly proper uh, the quotation that Patricia Ferguson gave from uh, the committee's stage one report, but it might be as well to continue from where she quoted. The committee recommends the government remove, renews the potential impact of altering the definition to include communication of any kind to establishing what amendments might be required. And the reason, of course, that is there is because the effect of extending the definition is not currently known. So I very much welcome the government's amendments to the bill, which will give us two years of running and then we will revisit uh, the subject and see what we want to do at that stage. And I think that's a proportionate response uh, to this issue. Uh, let me, I only know one little bit of sign language, which is, which identifies who I am as ZS, which is my working initials. And I just very much want to support George Adams' amendment. It's timely, appropriate, and the right thing to do. Thank you, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I'm going to struggle to resist the temptation to use some of the few signs that I know. Um, <laughs> I, I do very much welcome George Adams' amendment. Uh, I think it's important that we include uh, BSL. I was interested, though, that that amendment finishes or is otherwise made by signs. And it does seem to me that if we pass Amendment 23, but not those from Patricia Ferguson, we will be in the absurd position where semaphore would be included in lobbying, but email would not. Which century are we living in? Surely we have to include the broadest range of forms of communication, including those which are particularly powerful and are, we can only expect to be of increasing significance uh, in the future. Please let's pass these amendments and be serious about this bill. Thank you, Minister. President Officer, Patricia Ferguson's Amendment 12, 15 and 14 would substantially broaden the definition of regulated lobbying by including other forms of communication, particularly those made by electronic and written means, and would also give the Parliament the power by resolution to modify and or remove types of communication. The Government's view, uh, supported by the Standards Committee's original inquiry into lobbying, remains that face-to-face -face lobbying is the most influential means and, as I made clear at stage two, the government does not support extending the definition of regulated lobbying to include uh, other forms of communication. I am not persuaded that the additional burden this could place on organisation, organisations has been properly thought through, a view supported by many stakeholders, including the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations and the Federation of Small um, Businesses. The Government has, however, listened to views and brought forward an amendment agreed at stage two, which extended face-to-face -face communications to include those made by video conferencing and equivalent, in addition to those made in person. The review uh, provision, which was inserted into the Bill at stage two, provides an opportunity to learn from experience in the operation of the Act and found any potential changes to the types of communication on a clear evidence basis. Moving to Amendment 23, okay, quickly. Neil Finlay. Talking of a clear evidence basis, what evidence does he have, or has he ever had, that face-to-face -face communication is more effective than any other communication? He has no evidence, and he never has put it before Parliament. Minister. Um, I, I, I think there is evidence, which I will come to um, later. I I, I, Order, I, I, I am I'm particularly of the view, but I, I think the important thing is that 
um, we need to make sure that this bill is proportionate and there is no evidence to, to make there's no evidence Order, please. To, to assert the fact that it would not be a disproportionate burden to extend the um, definition in the way that um, Patricia Ferguson's amendment suggests to. Now moving to amendment 23, I thank George Adam for bringing forward this amendment and also to the Law Society of Scotland for raising the matter it deals with. The Government will support the amendment. This will make clear that the definition of regulated lobbying includes methods of communication used as alternatives to spoken word, which I think um, deals with uh, Patrick Harvey's um, point. Um, um, so alternatives to spoken word and recognises, uh, very importantly, recognises that British Sign Language is in itself a language. Um, I am I'm clear that British Sign Language and other such um, methods of communication, such as those used by the deafblind community and made face-to-face -face, um, or through an interpreter, should be included within the definition of regulated lobbying, and this amendment will helpfully put that beyond doubt. Uh, in conclusion, I would ask Parliament to oppose Amendments 12, 15 and 14 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, but invite the Parliament to agree to Amendment 23 in the name of George Adam. Thank you, Minister. I call Patricia Ferguson to wind up and indicate if you intend to press or withdraw, please. Oh, I definitely intend to press, presiding <laughs> officer. Um, I, I am, um, I'm actually struggling to know how to react to the contribution made by Stuart Stevenson. As I think Mr Stuart, Stuart Stevenson knows, I very much respect the way in which he handles the Standards Committee as its convener, and I very much enjoy the discussions and the debates we have. So I will just simply remind him, I'll not go into the detail in any, any further than this, than to remind him that the committee report, the committee of which he chairs, the committee report described this distinction being placed on this bill by the Scottish Government as an artificial distinction. That is the view of his committee. But I would also say to the Minister that I find the idea that somehow collating information about written communication would be harder than collating information about verbal communication. It stands to reason that one is recorded in writing on a computer and the other relies on individuals reporting it. It seems to me that we're in the 21st century here. We all know that the volume of emails and the volume of telephone calls we have has increased since this parliament even has been in existence. Many members will testify to the fact that constituency surgeries are no longer as well attended as they were in 1999. That doesn't mean that the volume of communications from constituents is any less. It just means that those constituents choose to communicate in a slightly different way and they do so by email. To exclude those issues from this bill is, to my mind, well, I'll take an intervention, Mr. Fitzgerald. Minister, and could other members stop having conversations across the chamber, please? Well, let, let me be very clear. The, uh, the, the bill, um, as framed, and, and it's very much our intention, would, would not, under any circumstances, catch the kind of um, uh, um, constituents coming to see their, their, their MSP. That those, those people coming to talk about um, housing issues on their, on their own behalf, the, the bill is very clear that those are, are, are not covered. Patricia Ferguson. I'm really surprised that after all these months, Mr Fitzpatrick thinks that I need to be told that. We know, we know, Parliament Order, please. knows, and if Parliament has read the bill and the amendments, Parliament knows that communication with one's constituents is not covered by the bill. The point I was making, and Mr Fitzpatrick must know this well, is that the way in which people of all kinds choose to communicate in 2016 is very different even from that that he chose to communicate with in 1999. If we don't include communication by email and by letter and by telephone, all things that are recorded by civil servants for ministers, I should say too, uh, then I think we are doing this bill a disservice and making this parliament, frankly, a laughing stock. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. It will be a division. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 12 is yes, 34, no, 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That then brings us to group three, regulated lobby and recipients of communications. And to call amendment 18 in the name of the minister, which is grouped with amendments 13, 16 and 20. And I ask the minister to move amendment 18 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. Presenting officer, um, sorry, the, pur yeah, the purpose of Patricia Ferguson's amendment, amendment 13 is to extend the scope of regulated lobbying to include communications made to people other than MSPs, ministers and special advisers. Her amendment 16 defines the civil servants she wishes to extend the bill to cover. Government's amendment 18 and 20 set out an alternative way forward. During the debate of Patricia Ferguson's near identical amendment during stage two, I made clear that I did not think her approach was proportionate. The committee agreed to a government amendment at stage two to extend the cover, coverage of the bill to include special advisers, and I undertook to consider further whether the bill should be extended to any other specific groups of public officials, and in doing so, to consult with the trade unions. The government was has carefully considered the possibility of including all senior civil servants as lobbyees and has concluded that the case has not been made to justify extending the bill in this way. In the first instance, there would be an increase in the volume of registrable lobbying activity, which would bring with it an additional burden to registrants. This has the potential to erode public engagement in Scotland. In addition, while civil, civil servants have uh, a clear linkage to ministers, they occupy a different space to politicians. There is a potential risk of unduly impacting on the day-to-day -day oper op operational duties that civil servants undertake, which do not influence the, the exercise of ministerial functions in a way that would generally be regarded as lobbying. Um, I do, however, recognise the unique position that the Permanent Secretary holds and Amendments 18 and 20 that um, I have lodged seek to include face-to-face -face communications with the Permanent Secretary within the definition of regulated lobbying. I remind members that the bill as amended um, at stage two um, includes a review pr provision which will allow the Parliament to learn from the experience of the Register and to build um, a clear evidence base on which to consider any future proposals for change. Um, I'd invite Patricia Ferguson to withdraw Amendment 13 and 16. If she chooses not to, then I ask the Parliament to oppose them. I move Amendment 18 and ask the Parliament to support 18 and 20 in my name. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Ferguson, speak to Amendment 13 and the other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, let me say that the Minister's move to include the Permanent Secretary is, of course, welcome. But the Permanent Secretary is only one amongst very many civil servants and officials who have responsibility and who will, by the Minister's own admission in his last contribution, uh, be receiving matters that may well be registrable lobbying if my amendments are actually passed. So I find that argument slightly odd. But I want to, as Parliament will understand, extend the definition of those who are covered by the Bill, Presiding Officer, and um, I, I want it to go further clearly than the Minister does. I would like it to include civil servants to the grade of deputy director level. And it seems to me that if this legislation is to be effective, not only has it to recognise that politicians are not the only people who are lobbied, but that officials may be too. And the public needs to know what lobbying takes place, and that is a large part of this bill. But I think that it must also have another purpose, and that is to protect those who may be lobbied from unwittingly falling foul of unscrupulous lobbyists. And the best way to do that is to make the situation as transparent as possible so that those public officials are protected by the openness that would apply to their dealings with lobbyists if that was to be registered. And I would just say to the Minister that he argues that uh, members of the civil service do not in and of themselves make decisions. Now that's something that perhaps could be argued. But who writes the briefings that ministers then make their decisions upon? The civil servants. And if those civil servants have been lobbied, should that not be something that's known? I think it should be. As I've said, I very much welcome the minister's change of direction in this particular area, 
But I do think if we are to give any kind of openness and transparency to this bill, that it does have to be extended to those civil service grades down to deputy director level. Thank you. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Ferguson and Joe Fitzpatrick have both had the happy privilege of serving as Scottish ministers. I am yet to enjoy that luxury. But my guess would be, my guess would be that the vast majority of the lobbying of senior civil servants is not, in fact, to the permanent secretary, but to others at other influential positions within the Scottish Government. Mr Fitzpatrick tells us and reminds us quite correctly that there, was, there is to be a review period. Well, if we're going to be as fully informed as we deserve to be in that review, then the time between now and then must capture the greatest amount of information about the lobbying that is taking place. We will be in a stronger position to decide whether the system is working if we've had the maximum transparency position in the intervening period. And for that reason, if for nothing else, uh, I'll be supporting Patricia Ferguson's amendments. Thank you. Uh, Minister, would you care to wind up, please? Um, yeah, very, very briefly. Um, I think we have to be very careful that we are no, we're not making decisions here today which would potentially have unintended consequences. I do understand that there is a, there's a body of opinion that, that feels that we should go much further in terms of how deep into the civil service should be covered by the lobbying bill, and that is why we have agreed to the we, we, we've proposed amendment at stage two um, to ensure there was a review um, provision specifically saying that this is one of the areas that the Parliament should look at, but I, I think we do need to see the, 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 the act in, in operation um, to make sure that we are, we are not um, very briefly. Neil Finlay. Seriously saying that all those people in government, the only person who gets lobbied and should be, uh, should be registered for is the permanent secretary. Is that what you're seriously telling us? Minister. What, what, what I'm saying is that, that um, we have got to the level, um, including special advisors and the permanent secretary, where we think that any lobbying should be registrable. And I am confident that that can be achieved without um, any unintended consequences on the operation both of the Scottish Government and also an impact on to people who are engaging with, with government. So um, I, I am very, very... Dr Simpson. Yet yeah, made it clear whether he's responded to Patrick Harvey's point that he will collect the data in the meantime so the review is actually fully informed. Minister. Th th there's two approaches here. Either you could say that we extend the, the register as far as possible, which I understand and respect as Patricia uh, Ferguson's view, or you say that we want to make sure that we are not having an unintended uh, impact. So I, I think the bill as proposed um, with my amendments and, and, and not supporting Patricia Me Ferguson's amendments is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I now call Amendment... Sorry, we are not all agreed. I'm going to call that again. So the que if, if someone wishes to disagree, please do so loudly. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Hammond is not agreed. There will be a division. It's a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 18 is yes, 96, no, 12. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. 
I now call Amendment 13 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, already debated with Amendment 18, and I ask Patricia Ferguson to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 13 is yes 35, no 74. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 15 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, already debated with Amendment 12, and I ask Patricia Ferguson to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 15 is yes 35, no 73. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. That then brings us to Group 4, Regulated Lobbying, Individuals Making Communications, and to call Amendment 17 in the name of Patrick Harvey in a group on its own. And I ask Patrick Harvey to move and speak to Amendment 17, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I have uh, already indicated informally to the Scottish Government and to Mr Finlay that I am bringing this amendment without necessarily a huge degree of determination about it, but with a desire to see some degree of discussion uh, about a form of lobbying which may not yet be a significant issue in Scotland, but which we can anticipate to see growing in the future. Uh, something which is not currently covered by the, uh, the, the, the system of, of lobbying regulation that we're establishing here, but which may grow and which I hope that the review will consider is around the operation of businesses which operate as a highly networked business model, marshalling and encouraging the, the large numbers of their customers to lobby effectively on their behalf, on the business's behalf, rather than on the behalf of the, the direct interest of the individual citizens. There are many, many cases around the world, for example, I think perhaps the most notorious example of uh, Uber, which whatever you View, whatever view you take of its business model and whether it's a, a good addition to the transport economy of a country, it has vigorously used its very networked customer base to lobby for favourable regulatory regimes, including in contexts where public safety is at significant threat and where regulations are intended to address that rather than to shut down the company's business altogether. Other companies uh, can be uh, identified, such as Facebook, have, have used similar tactics. As with the earlier discussion about the change in the way people communicate, we are also seeing a change in the way businesses operate. And the phenomenon of highly networked businesses, which can mobilise very quickly in an, a non-transparent and an unregulated way, the voices of great number of their customers to lobby on behalf of the business interests, we can expect this to be an increasing feature of lobbying. Whether we call it professional lobbying or whether we call it networking uh, is, is less the point. I, I've brought this uh, amendment merely to solicit the views, and to, I would be interested to know what view both those who've uh, argued for lobbying regulation from the opposition benches and what view the government takes on the way in which our system of lobbying regulation should deal with this new and emerging form uh, of commercial lobbying 
as and when it develops in Scotland. And I move Amendment uh, 17. Many thanks. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I understand exactly the motivation that Patrick Harvey has here. Um, I think, however, in practice, he's in danger of falling into something which he himself would be strongly opposed to, uh, which is what the UK government is doing in trying to stop charities being involved in lobbying as a result of being charities. And I just give as an example that might, might, and I do not assert this to be absolute, might fall out of uh, what Mr Harvey brings to us. He, he says essentially uh, that a member of, and I only choose this as a very large organisation, the RSPB, uh, could not be lobbied by a paid employee of the RSPB to be part of a campaign on an issue the RSPB felt very strongly about. It, it's very analogous uh, to shutting off uh, bodies of that kind that are professionally run, employ large numbers of people, but have huge bodies of support who might, if this were to happen, not be able to be informed uh, to aid their own personal lobbying activities uh, in line with their beliefs as a member of the RSPB or many other organisations. So I think it's a very good thing to bring to the Parliament and discuss, and it should certainly form part of uh, what we look at at the end of the review period, but I would be very much uh, reluctant to support this in the form that it is before us for the reasons that I hope Patrick Harvey will understand. Thank you. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We on this side are very pleased that Patrick Harvey brought forward this amendment because we think it does highlight an area that had not been thought of in terms of the bill. I suspect that Patrick Harvey is right, that it is perhaps not something that needs to be decided on today or should be decided on today, and that when the review comes forward, as we hope it will in early um, time in the next session of the Parliament, that people in Parliament and beyond will be much more familiar with the type of business model he describes and therefore perhaps much more able to make a, a, a reasoned judgment on that. These new technologies are growing and they are allowing people to have that kind of networking relationship. And I think it is right that we consider how best they should be included in this bill. I personally think they should be ultimately included within our lobbying regulation. But then again, I'm naive enough to think that electronic communication in a more normal way should be included in the bill. <laughs> thank you, Minister. Thank you. Um, and can I, can I thank um, Patrick Harvey's for his explanation of his amendment? Um, and I think even he probably agrees that there isn't a requirement for such a provision within this bill um, today. The amendment as drafted is, I think, ambiguous and in areas unclear about its intention, and, and for obvious reasons, um, when, when we hear the members' uh, reasons. Um, but as it stands, it would, it's a complex provision which doesn't align directly with the key principles considered when developing the bill um, as proportionate um, and simple uh, to, uh, to operate. Um, that said, I, I thank Patrick Harvey for raising this issue, which will allow the Parliament to consider whether it should be included as part of the review of the operation of the Act. And I invite Patrick Harvey to withdraw Amendment 17. If he decides not to, then I would ask Parliament to resist. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Harvey, to wind up, please and indicate if you intend to press or seek to withdraw. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the constructive comments that have been made on the need to address in some form the issues that this amendment uh, merely seeks to invite debate on today. I, I would say in relation to NGOs and the, the many, whether it's RSPB or somebody I've got less sympathy for uh, lobbying, I, I think a, a great many of those organisations already expect to have their professional uh, campaigners and, and lobbying op operations fall within the ambit of the regulation system. This would simply be one more dimension of a system of regulation they're already expecting to comply with and which I don't think will be disproportionate. So I, I don't think that the, the concerns around the impact on NGOs uh, should prevent us from debating how in the future we may take a, a more robust approach to commercial uh, interests using these, these um, networked uh, uh, business models, the, the, this huge network of, of customer base that they have uh, to lobby in their own interests. Uh, don't get me wrong, I see far more to welcome uh, in the, the networked age than to fear. Uh, but the, there is a necessary debate about how the platforms uh, which are emerging for these huge 
uh, and, and exciting networked uh, aspect of, of our lives, how these platforms are to work in the common interest, in the public interest, rather than merely being co-opted to serve commercial private interests. I do hope that this is something that we'll be able to return to uh, in the review uh, and come up with a system which will be relevant for the, these emerging aspects. And with that, I would ask Parliament's permission to withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Harvey seeks to withdraw Amendment 17. Does any member object? Since no member objects, that amendment is withdrawn. We now move on to Group 5, Money and Time Spent Lobbying. And I call Amendment 2 in the name of Neil Finlay, Group with Amendments 7, 8 and 9. And I ask Neil Finlay to move Amendment 2 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. Hey, thanks, President Officer. It's my contention that the public are most concerned about the influence of powerful and wealthy or often well-connected individuals and or organisations who use their power and wealth and connections to gain access to decision makers, to influence policy, to win contracts or to exert influence over government and parliament in other ways. People are less concerned about small-scale, relatively insignificant lobbying. My original bill consultation took account of the concerns raised by small businesses, community organisations and charities that small-scale lobbying might be included. We listened to those conce with concerns uh, about a bill that would prevent rather than encourage dialogue with this parliament and access to it. And in keeping with other jurisdictions, almost one third of which operate a threshold system, we developed that very principle. A lobbying threshold, I believe, is the most appropriate, fair and proportionate way of dealing with this. So these amendments establish a time threshold for in-house lobbyists and a financial threshold for consultant lobbyists. By creating a threshold system, small scale, insignificant lobbying would not be covered, but more significant lobbying would. I'll move the amendments and, uh, amendment, sorry, amendment five, uh, sorry, amendment two and seven. Um, amendment eight and nine, these amendments provide information in terms of the scale of investment made in lobbying activity. The public is rightly concerned with how much money is invested by organisations to get results, because that's what lobbying is. It is an investment by an organisation to get results. There's a great deal of difference in spending a few hundred pounds for an MSP photo shoot holding a placard and tens of thousands of pounds trying to win a ferries contract or a railways franchise. In my consultation, we took evidence from businesses who were concerned that identifying the actual amount spent would be commercially sensitive. So we agreed a compromise where a system of banding would indicate the scale within set parameters. The amendment sets out these scales for both consultant lobbyists and in-house lobbyists. This is all about openness and transparency, and I move the amendments in my name. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. You would imagine uh, from what Mr Finlay has said that the bill as it presently stands would exclude lobbying for a ferries contract or a railway franchise. But of course, that is very far from the case. That would already be captured as regulated lobbying because people would be being paid to do that lobbying. There is already a lobbying threshold. The threshold is that if you get paid, I, I speak broadly, there are of course some caveats, then you're captured and if you're doing it of your own volition and without financial reward, then you're not caught. There is a threshold. That is a clear and unambiguous threshold that will not be open to the enthusiastic chosen interpretation of accountants. If we want to get into the position where uh, we have a subjective view from accountants as to whether something is in or out, so be it. I won't support that. I think simply the threshold definition that's already in the bill is the appropriate one, and I encourage members to leave the bill unamended by Mr Finlay's amendment. Thank you, Minister. Well, sir, this group of amendments from Neil Finlay are the same as those he lodged at stage two and which were opposed by the committee. The amendments do two things. Um, first, to offer a threshold to remove small-scale lobbying from the registration scheme, and secondly, to include financial data um, and time spent lobbying in the register. I agree with Mr Finlay that we should seek to remove small-scale lobbying from the registration scheme, and that's why I've brought forward amendments 21, 22 and 22b, which I'll invite Parliament to support later. 
My amendments will exempt small-scale lobbying and exempt constituency-based communications. They do so in a way that is simple and understandable to operate. Um, unlike the complexities of Mr Finlay's amendments, I wish to make clear again, as I did at stage two, that I do not think the case has been made um, to, red, to require registrants to provide financial data in connection with regulated lobbying. I would therefore invite Parliament to oppose Mr Finlay's amendments. Thank you. Can I now invite Neil Finlay to wind up and indicate if you intend to press or withdraw, please? Press the, uh, press the amendments. That was quick. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number two is yes, 31, no, 77. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 14 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, already debated with amendment 12, and I ask Patricia Ferguson to move or not move. Move, presiding officer. Thank you. Question then is that amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14 is yes 35, no 73. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 23 in the name of George Adam, already debated with amendment 12, and I ask George Adam to move or not to move. Move, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm calling that again. The question is, that Amendment 23 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. We now turn to Group 6, Employment History of Lobbyists, and I call Amendment 3 in the name of Neil Finlay, which is grouped with Amendments 4, 5 and 6, and I ask Neil Finlay to move Amendment 3 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer. Um, these amendments relate to the revolving door principle. That is where... Uh, that is where senior politicians, civil servants, special advisers, etc., having served in a in, having served in the civil service or government, leave their post armed with a hefty black book full of contacts, inside knowledge of the policy process, the key players, the decision makers, and a very good idea of future developments, spending proposals, or likely proposals. They then take up a post in business or finance or with a lobbying company or another organisation and are free to use those links on behalf of their new employees and their clients. Opportunities not available to the ordinary man and woman in the street. We only need to look at some of the lobbying organisations uh, and businesses detailed in the uh, uh, Spinwatch uh, Guide to Hollywood Lobbying that, uh, that was recently published to see this at work. If you look at the personnel of 
Charlotte Street Partners. Order, please. There's a bit of chat going on. Could we have quiet, please, Mr Finlay? If we look at the personnel of Charlotte Street Partners, Weber Shandwick or Edinburgh Airport, just as examples, very well-connected ex-politicians, civil servants and special advisers, with a huge advantage over ordinary members of the public and over their business competitors at work. Um, over their business competitors. These amendments would uh, compel uh, people in that position to, on their lobbying returns, record their employment record for the previous five years. So, for example, the former head of the civil service, Sir John Elvidge, now chairs Edinburgh Airport. If he was lobbying, then he would detail his previous role, allowing the public to deduce whether there may be an, uh, any uh, correlation between his past role and the government's policy on, say, for example, scrapping air passenger duty or airport expansion and whether there is any contradiction with that and the government's policy on climate change. These amendments are about openness, they are about transparency and I believe they should be supported. Move them. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Officer, um, as Neil Finlay has just outlined, his amendments 3, 4, 5 and 6 all seek to introduce a requirement um, for those who register to provide retrospective information about their employment history or the employment history of those lobbying on their behalf. As I made clear during stage 2, I do not agree the case has been made to require those who are undertaking lobbying activity to have their past employment history publicly disclosed. It is important to remember that these amendments would apply to all people who are undertaking regulated lobbying and there would be a situation where individuals being required to publish such information would be clearly disproportionate. The committee noted in its stage one report that it was satisfied that the inclusion of individuals' names on the register will enable those with an interest to probe the employment history of those involved in lobbying, as clearly Mr Finlay managed to do um, with uh, Sir Eldridge. Um, considering civil servants and special advisers, I repeat exactly what I said during stage two, that there are already existing arrangements in place to scrutinise the future employment of civil servants and special advisers and a restriction on former ministers to ensure they do not lobby government for two years following the end of their appointment. In conclusion, I would ask Neil Finlay to withdraw his amendments. If not, I would ask the Parliament to oppose them. Thank you, Mr Finlay. Do you wish to wind up? And can you indicate if you intend to press or withdraw? Press the amendments. Thank you. In which case, the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number three is yes, 29, no, 76. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I call amendment four in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with amendment three, and to ask Neil Finlay to move or not to move. Move. The member has moved. The question is that amendment four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30 second division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on amendment number four is yes 29, no 76. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment five in the name of Neil Findlay, already debated with amendment three, and I ask Neil Findlay to move or not move. Move. The member has moved. The question is that amendment five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This is a 30-second division. Please vote now. Vote on amendment number five is yes 28, no 76. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment six in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with amendment three, and I ask Neil Finlay to move or not move. Move. Me the member has moved. The question is that amendment six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This is a 30 second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number six is yes 29, no 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment seven in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with amendment two, and I ask Neil Finlay to move or not move. Move. The member has moved. The question is that amendment seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This will be a 30 second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number seven is yes 29, no 76. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment eight in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with amendment two, and I ask Neil Finlay to move or not move. Move. The member has moved. The question then is that amend amendment eight be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This is a 30 second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number eight is yes 29, no 76. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment nine in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with amendment two, and to ask Neil Finlay to move or not move. Move. The member has moved. The question is that amendment nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This will be a 30 second division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 9 is yes 29, no 76. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. That then brings us to Group 7, Offences and Sanctions, and I call Amendment 10 in the name of Neil Finlay in a group on its own, and I ask Neil Finlay to move and speak to Amendment 10, please. Yeah, thanks, President Officer. This amendment provides for a sliding scale of warnings, alerts and sanctions for those who fail to register, who register and commit a breach uh, of the terms of the register. In practice, this would mean the organisation being warned of its failure via the clerk, uh, it, um, clerk and if after this, they still fail to address these concerns. A sliding scale of punishment prior to conviction would be suggested, with the ultimate sanction being that they be struck off the register for a period of three years and or a fine. Being barred from the register uh, and, that and that becoming common knowledge may indeed be the most effective, effective sanction and will ensure others are not tempted to try and breach the terms of the register. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Minister. President Officer, Amendment 10 is a similar amendment to one Mr Finlay lodged at Stage 2, which was opposed by the committee five votes to one. It would create a criminal offence. Of course. Neil Finlay. He, he has raised this several times when it suits his argument, but when it doesn't suit his argument, he never mentions it. Minister. Sorry. Order, please. Order. Minister. Yeah. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll just move on. It would create a criminal offence with no criminal penalty. I understand um, it's also his intention to introduce a more serious penalty for a second or subsequent offence um, and for that person then to be potentially prevented from lobbying for, for three years. I appreciate the spirit um, which the amendment seeks to offer registrants some latitude in respect of initial failures to comply with the registration scheme. However, I remain of the view that the amendment will not deliver that intention. It's unclear how a sanction preventing a person from engaging in regulated lobbying activity would be enforced. The government considers that the existing statutory framework set out in the bill provides a proportionate approach in respect of offences. Both the provision of guidance and the role of the clerk and commissioner backed by the possibility of criminal sanctions provide an approach which is both fair to registrants and sufficient to ensure the robustness of the registration regime. For those reasons, I would ask Neil Finlay to withdraw Amendment 10, but if, if not, I would ask Parliament to oppose them. Thank you. Neil Finlay, do you wish to wind up and please indicate if you intend to press or withdraw? Press the amendment. Thank you. The amendment has been pressed, in which case the question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10 is yes 35, no 72. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. That then brings us to group 8, public awareness, and I call amendment 11 in the name of Neil Finlay, grouped with amendment 19. I ask Neil Finlay to move amendment 11 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer. Move amendment 11. The, uh, this amendment seeks to ensure that... Uh, adequate resources and investment is made in any system and that legisl the legislation is implemented successfully. Uh, we can't introduce any new system on a whim or on a shoestring. We have to put in the resources to raise awareness of the changes that this bill brings in and that the register can be effect effectively monitored and enforced. Uh, I recently heard the Irish regulator speak at an expert seminar in Stirl at Stirling University 
and she was very clear that investment and education is required to ensure legislation is successful. Uh, and she, uh, her, in her words, uh, what price a well-functioning and transparent democracy? Uh, I agree with her and move the amendment. Thank you, Minister. Sorry, officer, again, Neil Finlay lodged an identical amendment at stage two. It has so, two sorry, Minister, I should have said, could you speak to Amendment 19 and other amendments in the group? Okay, Apologies. Sorry. Okay, will do. Um, again, Neil, Neil Finlay lodged an identical amendment at stage two. It has two parts. Firstly, it provides that the Parliament may make available information with a view to raising awareness of the Act. And secondly, the amendment would require the Parliament to make available sufficient funding to support such activities. And I am sympathetic towards the first part of Mr Finlay's amendment. And as indicated um, at stage two, I have brought forward Amendment 19 in my name, which will enable the Parliament to take such steps as it considers appropriate to promote public awareness and understanding of the operation of the Act. This will, of course, be complementary to the existing provisions in the Bill requiring the Parliament to publish guidance um, on the operation of the Act. I still cannot support the second part of Mr Finlay's uh, Stage 2 amendment, um, um, which, um, in my view, the, um, it must be left to the Scottish Parliament corporate body to make decisions about the use of their overall bu uh, budget, which is available to the Parliament. I do not think it is appropriate for us in a bill to, to be taking that action. So I therefore invite Parliament to support Amendment 19 in my name and to oppose Amendment 11. Thank you. And I invite Neil Finlay to wind up and indicate if you intend to press or withdraw. Press the amendment. In which case the question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11 is yes 30, no 66. There were 11 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 19 in the name of the Minister, which has already been debated with amendment 11, and I ask the Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. Question is that amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I now call Amendment 16 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, which has already been debated with Amendment 18, and I ask Patricia Ferguson to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The member has moved. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This will be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16 is yes 35, no 72. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 20 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 18. And I ask the minister to move formally, please. Moved. Thank you. Question is that amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. 
That then brings us to Group 9, Communications, which are not lobbying. And I call Amendment 21 in the name of the Minister, which is grouped with Amendments 22, 22A and 22B. And I ask the Minister to move Amendment 21 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The three amendments in my name in this group deal with important elements on how the lobbying regime will operate. So I'm going to take some time to explain why the Government is proposing these changes. This Parliament is rightly proud of its reputation for being open and accessible and for the relationships it has built with individuals and organisations across Scotland. I know that all members place particular importance on the engagement they have with their constituents, whether that be businesses and other organisations or individuals. I have been listening carefully to members' concerns during the pa passage of the Bill about the potential for it to impact on that legitimate engagement. At stage two, I intimated to the committee that I wanted to consider options that would seek to exempt constituency-based communications and small-scale lobbying. These three amendments will help ensure that the lobbying regime created by this Bill will be proportionate and will not deter engagement with MSPs and Ministers. Amendment 21 is what I would describe as the constituency-based exemption. It seeks to exempt all communications made by an individual, as, for example, an employee in the course of a business or other activity carried out by a person, and that is person in the legal sense, um, and on that person's behalf to uh, a local constituency or regional list MSP. In respect of local, this means an MSP for the constituency or the region in which the person's business or other activity is ordinarily carried on, um, or the place of residence of the individual who made the communication. The exemption will apply regardless of where the communication takes place. For example, the communication could be made when a local MSP attends a small business gala event in their constituency at which representations are made to them about particular issues concerning local or national policies. Indeed. Neil Finlay. Thanks, Minister. My uh, region covers the whole of the Lothian region, of which um, dozens of lobbying organisations are based. That means that they can lobby me as their constituency member, and none of that needs registered. Is that what you're saying? Minister? No, um, uh, the member is, is not correct. Um, it is very clear that this um, exemption relates to organisations lobbying on their own behalf. So um, third party lobbying organisations are always lobbying on behalf of a, a, a party. Um, well, I think we need to make some progress. Neil Finlay. If an organisation that is lobbying me on their own behalf contacts me as, on the region, as a regional uh, MSP, that does not need to be registered. Is that what you're telling me? Minister? Yes, that's exactly what we're saying. What we're saying is we want to make sure that, that legitimate constituency-based um, engagement is, is, is not covered by this. However, we do recognise that there is a distinction between um, um, ministers and cabinet secretaries and other members, and therefore the constituency-based exemption... Minister, could I stop you for a moment? The noise in the chamber is becoming louder. We cannot hear the minister. Thank you. The, the constituency-based exemption does not exempt communications made to MSPs who are also members of the Scottish Government or junior Scottish ministers. That then takes me to Amendment 22. Will, no, I, I'm going to make some progress. Amendment 22 will exempt all communications made by an individual as, for example, an employee in the course of a business or other activity carried on by another person. Again, that is person in the legal sense um, on that person's behalf, where that person, for example, a small business or other type of organisation, has less than 10 full-time equivalent employees. The number of full-time equivalent employees that person has will be based on the number of hours worked by all employees in the 28 days. I'll, I'll, I'll complete this, I think. Well, hours by all employees in the 28 days ending on the date of the communication. Full-time equivalent for these purposes is based on a notional 35-hour week for a full-time member of staff. That is, that's 140 hours over the 28-day periods, and this will be the maximum number of hours that be, can be counted for any individual full-time member of staff. And I give away. Joanne Lamont. For taking intervention and genuinely interests of understanding what has been proposed, is it being suggested if an organisation employs somebody as a lobbyist, to come and lobby somebody who represents a region that wouldn't be registered. However, if they go to an external organisation whose expertise is to lobby, that would have to be registered. What you're saying is there a distinction, although the job being done is the exact same. 
What's to stop an organisation simply, rather than employing somebody externally, employing somebody as part of their organisation to do that in order to not disclose that they're lobbying uh, MSPs? Minister? What, what, we're, what we're trying to do in terms of the constituency-based um, exemption is to make sure that legitimate engagement between businesses and organisations um, between them and their constituency or list member uh, does not require to be, law, to, to be registered. There may be several reasons why an organisation might want to, for instance, give um, a constituency or list member um, the heads up about uh, an impeding challenge in terms of employment within that member's constituency. And I, I think we want to make sure that kind of engagement continu can continue. Government recognises that in this case there is a difference between um, most MSPs and MSPs who are also Scottish Government and junior ministers, and it's very difficult to unpick that in the time, which is why that, that exemption does not um, extend to ministers. If I can move back on to um, Amendment 22 in terms of the small organisations, um, I recognise um, a, a campaign that um, was quite, a, I think, quite effective, and a lot of us will have received emails from the, 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 the campaign from, from SALT, um, who had felt that they had identified a potential um, loophole in what the government's amendments were. Um, so that the government's intention in terms of, in relation to representative bodies, the government's intention is that representative bodies do not benefit from the small organisation exemption, and the focus should be avoiding undue burdens being placed on other smaller organisations. So, if a core purpose of a body is to represent the views of its members, it should not benefit from that exemption. In response to concerns from stakeholders, as I've said, um, and, and also Mr Harvey's amendment, um, I've brought forward Amendment 22B, which, although we didn't feel it was ever required, we think it does make it clearer that small organisations' um, exemption does not apply to representative bodies. And so... Patrick Harvey's amendment 22A, in my view, goes too far. It seeks to exclude from the small organisation exemption bodies with one or more full-time equivalent body um, if that body exists primarily to represent the interests of its members and the relevant communications are made on behalf of any of its members or to take up particular issues um, and the relevant communication is made in the furtherance of any of those issues. I agree with the principle of, obviously, of the first part of Mr Harvey's amendment that representative bodies should not benefit from the exemption, which is that why I brought forward um, Amendment 22B, to put that beyond doubt. However, I think there's a fundamental issue with the second part of Mr Harvey's amendment, which seeks to exclude from the small organisation exemption what I would describe as advocacy groups, unless they have less than one full-time equivalent employee, which exists on the basis of and to take up and promote a particular issue. I think every single one of us in this chamber will have our own examples of when we've met or visited a small group which tirelessly campaigns to raise awareness of a particular issue or a small charity which does all it can to better the lives of the people of Scotland. These entities also typically operate with minimal resources and I, I ask the question, do we really want communications by that type of small organisation to be caught? The answer I, I, I hope most will agree is, is no, uh, which is why I ask Parl Parliament not to support the amendment in the name of Patrick Harvey. Amendments 21, 22, 22, 21, 22 and 22B in my name taken together will help ensure that individuals and businesses and organisations will retain the ability to freely engage with their elected representatives in the constituency they are based and for smaller organisations to avoid a disproportionate burden that engaging with MSPs and ministers might present. I'm keen to ensure that all legitimate engagement between MSPs and ministers and local businesses and organisations and our individual constituents is not inhibited by the bill. These amendments strike a balance between delivering transparency and to avoiding inhibiting engagement. The requirement for the Parliament to review the operation of this Act will ensure that we can reflect on whether that balance has been correctly struck. What um, I have presented is a clear and it's simple to operate. That reflects one of the underpinning principles I have retained throughout the bill process. So I move Amendment 21. I uh, ask Parliament to support Amendment 21, 22 and 22B in my name. And I, I would hope Mr Harvey will withdraw Amendment 22 in his name. If not, I'd ask Parliament to reject it. Thank you. And I invite Patrick Harvey to speak to Amendment 22A and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think most of us do recognise that there is an issue with very small organisations uh, and that the way in which the re regulation system treats them might not need to be the same as, as 
the way in which it treats uh, large, well-resourced, well-staffed lobbying uh, outfits. Uh, but I think the fact that the Minister has come forward with Amendment 22B demonstrates uh, an acknowledgement that, uh, that 22 uh, is a wee bit too much blanket protection in that regard. I, I think all of us recognise the picture he painted of the small, underfunded or, or in perhaps entirely unfunded, uh, you know, locally kind of crowdsource funded or whatever, small advocacy organisations, charitable purposes uh, with whom we would all have a great deal of sympathy. But surely we can also all acknowledge that there are small organisations which might have uh, very few staff, very little in the way of direct resourcing, but which represent the interests of something much more significant, much more commercial, uh, and represent that with a much more politically powerful voice. I think Amendment 22A uh, gets the balance uh, uh, right, uh, more so than I think 22B in the Minister's name. Uh, I, I, I do think that the, the caveat that this introduces to that small organisation exemption uh, will leave us with a, a stronger bill and make sure that we strike the right balance in, in terms of who is brought into the lobbying regime and who isn't. And let's remember, we're not creating a lobbying regulatory regime which is itself profoundly overburdensome. Uh, I think, by and large, this is a, a step in the right direction, this bill, a step in the right direction. It doesn't take us everywhere we need to get to, uh, but I do think Amendment 22A will strike the balance right on this small organisation exemption more so than 22B. If I can say a few words about uh, Amendment 21 uh, on the issue of residency or, or rather constituency and regional relevance, because we're, we're not necessarily talking about residency for individuals. Although I, I note that it, uh, uh, in um, 1AC3, it talks about the individual's residence. It doesn't necessarily uh, imply to me their permanent or fixed residence. I wonder whether an individual uh, you know, representing the, the interests of their own business or, or, or any other uh, might be able simply to rent a flat uh, for a week in the constituency uh, of the First Minister's parliamentary liaison officer in order to ensure that they can lobby them outside the scope of the regulatory, re regulatory regime or uh, indeed uh, in, in the constituency of a committee chair if they want to lobby them outside the scope uh, of the regulatory regime. And I also wonder about the phrases, uh, a place where the person's business is ordinarily carried on or activity is ordinarily carried on. What if we're talking about Tesco? Isn't their business carried on in every constituency in Scotland? There are organisations which can't be pinned down in that narrow, specific way uh, and who might well find ways to, to use this as a loophole to avoid complying with the regulatory regime because they want to have the kind of communications that they would just rather not be treated uh, in the transparent way that this bill should be all about. So I do have severe reservations about Amendment 21. Many thanks. I have three members at the moment indicating they would wish to speak. I call Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I hadn't actually planned to speak on Amendment 22, um, but in the course of the discussion, I actually do wonder whether the original uh, ten text of the, the bill, where we were specifically talking about lobbyists being people employed for the purpose by organisations might not have actually been a better definition than trying to do all the things the Minister is trying to do with that paragraph for the very reasons that Patrick Harvey has given. But I really do want to talk about um, Amendment 21 because Neil Findlay and Patrick Harvey and Joanne Lamont have already pointed out flaws in that particular uh, element of the bill. But I would just say to the Minister that as it stands, not only would the person who works within Mr uh, Finlay's uh, region be exempted from lobbying if they were talking to the constituency member where their business was based and all the regional members, but if for talking sake that individual lived in my constituency in Glasgow, they'd also, in the terms of your bill, be exempted from the lobbying regulations from, talk, from having to declare that they've spoken to me or any of the regional members in Glasgow. I don't know what the third one about activity actually means. And it might be interesting if the Minister could explain that 
So it seems to me that there are far too many exemptions involved in this particular paragraph. But I would also say to the Minister in more general terms that I have a, a, a real question mark over this Amendment 21 because it seems to me to add to what is already a very long list of situations where communications with an MSP will not be considered to be lobbying. And I wonder if the Minister could explain how the amendment to the schedule, which talks about the people who are not captured by the bill, squares with part one of the bill that details who is captured. Because it seems to me that those are potentially contradictory. And it would be very helpful if the Minister could explain that. It seems to me they're contradictory because the category of people included in the bill, the same category of people are then excluded in the schedule. So those two things can't possibly square. And I wonder if the Minister could explain that. Thank you. Call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Neil Finlay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome uh, the protection that there is for the interaction between members uh, and interests that are in their constituency. And I illustrate this in a number of ways. Um, I have a number of companies with nine-figure uh, turnover that operate wholly and exclusively within my constituency and within no other constituency. Um, I'll name one example, which would be Peterhead Harbour Board, where the turnover is well in excess of £100 million a year. Um, were they to be inhibited in being able to invite me in to discuss a harbour development, to suggest to me that it's a good idea that a harbour development took place in advance of their committing, to receive my views and advice on that matter, I think that would be a quite improper interference. Uh, one moment, please. A quite uh, pr improper uh, intervention and confusion between my right to to talk with my constituents, hundreds of whose jobs depend on the success of that particular business. Now, the moment that that business then interacts with the government to seek grants, then it becomes caught by the Act. Of course it does. Furthermore, if they chose to have an advisor who's sitting there acting on their behalf talking to me, they're equally caught. So I think there is a fine line. I, I will, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Finlay, I did do the courtesy of saying I would take him. Having made that point, I'll now take his intervention. Neil Finlay. I'm, I'm astonished. You were the chair of the committee mm -hmm. that took all the evidence. And you know that none of that is true because what happens is all you need to... Order, please. I don't think... Order, please, Mr. Finlay. You, you know that the evidence does not support that from the committee's evidence sessions. You, all that would happen would be the person would have to register and you would have the, your dialogue with anyone you want. No one is inhibited from anything. Could members remember to speak through the chair, please? Um, presiding Mr. officer, let me, let me just say, I absolutely accept that the company in question, which I use an example, would be likely to become registered. But I feel that if we are getting in the position where we are saying to constituents who have genuine interests in the constituency, for city members, it might be a single institu educational institution that has significant issues it wishes to raise with its member. Not necessarily in the context of their being registered. They might subsequently have to register, I accept. Uh, I will also take Mr. Harvey, Patrick if I'm allowed. Harvey. I'm, I'm grateful for, for the member taking the intervention. The member talks about constituents, and doesn't that come down to the nub of it? Our constituents are citizens. They have votes. Businesses do not have votes. They are not our constituents. People working in them are, in, are our constituents. Pe Order, if members please. will permit Order. the argument. People working in those businesses are our constituents, and nothing in this bill inhibits them as individual citizens from contacting their MSPs. This is about whether businesses should be treated as though they are themselves our constituents. Businesses don't have votes, and there is a good reason why their lobbying should be treated very differently from an individual citizen seeking to have a meeting with their representative. Stuart Stevenson. I, I, I do wonder, presiding officer, uh, whether I live in a uniquely different world where the businesses in my constituency... Order, please. It is, it, it is possible, presiding officer. It is possible. 
businesses in my constituency feel quite comfortable to approach and discuss their plans for their businesses. And it is proper they so do, because that affects the livelihoods of thousands of people in my constituency. And if there are members in this parliament in a different position, I pity them rather than envy them. Thank you. Neil Finlay. Uh, President officer, none of this was ever about small organisations. None of this is ever about constituency business. We see the, all through the course of the bill and the debates around lobbying, we see shoals of red herrings brought out time and time and time again. And there's a lot of bad stuff has gone into this bill as the government has taken it through. Yes, that's right, you heard correct. Order, please. But th these amendments, these amendments are just nonsense. If passed, it means that a constituent of mine who is a lobbyist but who meets me to lobby uh, uh, at their place of work, let's say in Edinburgh, do doesn't have to register. Given that my region covers the whole of the Lothians, that means a whole number of employees... <laughs> just, just let me get through the point. A whole num a number of employees who contact me directly and want to sit down and discuss lobbying activity would not be covered. That is nonsense. Take this. Mr. Stevenson. I, I wonder if the member can uh, assure me that he's making a very clear distinction between um, someone who is representing a lobbying company talking about the business of that company as distinct from speaking about the business of their clients, which is lobbying caught by the regulated lobbying provisions of this bill. Because I'm uncertain as to why that category of uh, companies should be excluded from meeting the constituency member uniquely among companies. Neil Finlay. Yes, I am talking about that, and that's it clarified. Now, let me tell you, in relation to the amendment about under 10 employees, presiding officer, of all the stuff Order, in the bill, please. this is the most farcical of all the amendments put forward by the Minister. He should at least have the dignity and self-respect to look embarrassed with this rubbish that he's brought forward because there is no evidence, no evidence during the committee stage to support this amendment. Where does the figure of 10 employees come from? Why is it not 20? Why is it not 5? Why is it not 3? No rationale for this proposal. And let's look at some of the organisations who now, with this stroke of genius from the Minister, will not be covered. Mm -hmm. The Faculty of Advocates, the Association of British Pharma Pharmaceutical Industry, Scotland, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Scotland, the Scottish Licensed Trade Association, the Federation of Small Businesses, Order. Scottish CND, Institute of Directors, Scottish Grocers Association, and the CBI Scotland, all of whom have under 10 employees and would not be covered by the bill. All organisations who lobby this parliament effectively and regularly, none of them covered because of the amendment brought forward by the minister. What a farce, what a, what a sham this is. The minister should be ashamed of himself. Minister, to wind up, please. Okay, um, Could we you, have order, please? Thank you please? very much, presiding officer. And it's good to see Mr Finlay's woken up at last. Um, so, um, let, let's, 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 initially, let's initially address the, the... I was expecting some more fire earlier on. Let, let's initially deal with Mr Finlay's list of um, organisations. Th those organisations, in the main, are all representative organisations, so therefore, if they are lobbying, they're never lobbying on their own behalf, they're lobbying on behalf of their members. Um, we, were, we were confident that the bill made, caught them and this, the exclusion 22 did not, not remove them. However... Taken on board the amendment brought forward by Patrick Harvey and the comments, I think I'll finish making my point. And taken on 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 board the amendment by Mr. Harvey and the campaign from Salt, um, I felt and my off officials um, helped me draft an amendment which was drawn actually from Mr. Harvey's amendment, which takes that beyond any doubt. So there is no question that those sorts of representative bodies are covered by the bill. On the, other, on the wider issue, I, I, 
we, what we have tried to do is to bring forward a bill and an amendment here which strikes a balance between delivering transparency and avoiding inhibiting engagement. Now, we've, we've had to decide where we felt that balance was. And I respect the fact that some folk, Mr Harvey, Patricia Ferguson, Neil Finlay, have a different view of where that balance is. And I think that is one of the strengths of the review process that we've built into the bill, that the, the Parliament can look back and, they can, and the future Parliament and the future committee can decide, have we struck that balance correctly? If not, they can make changes. And I think that, that, that's very important. Patricia Ferguson um, raised a point in terms of thinking the exclusion somehow contradicted the earlier parts of the bill. The earlier parts of the bill are drawn very, very widely. And um, so that, that catches a great number of people. The, the, the schedule in terms of exclusions then removes some people from, from, that, 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 um, from that wider pool. Um, on that basis, I think the bill we have, that these amendments, I think, taken together um, are, are, are really strong. So I, I hope colleagues will support my amendments and reject the amendment from Mr Harvey. Thank you. The question is that amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now. Vote on amendment number 21 is yes, 77, no, 31. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I now call amendment 22 in the name of the Minister, which has already been debated with amendment 21, and to ask the Minister to move formally, please. Formally moved. Thank you. I call amendment 22B in the name of the Minister, which has already been debated with amendment 21, and ask the Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 22B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. This is a 30-second division. Please vote now. Number 22B is yes, 77, no, 31. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I now call Amendment 22A in the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated with Amendment 21. And I ask Patrick Harvey to move or not move. Moved. The member has moved. The question is that Amendment 22A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed. This is a 30-second division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on Amendment 20, number 22A is yes, 35, no, 73. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the question now is that Amendment 22, as amended, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. This is a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 22 as amended is yes 76 no 31 there were no abstentions the amendment is therefore agreed and that ends consideration of amendments the next item of business is a debate on motion number 15870 in the name of joe fitzpatrick on the lobby in scotland bill i'll allow a few seconds for members to change places in the chamber to clear So, as already intimated, the next item of business is a debate on motion number 15870 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the lobby in Scotland Bill. And I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to and move the motion. Minister, you have nine minutes, please. Mr. Officer, in opening this debate, I'd like to thank all members for their contribution to the development of the lobby in Scotland Bill, which I hope Parliament will in due course approve. I opened the stage one debate in January by highlighting the distinct character of this bill. It's been brought forward by the government, yet it is very much parliamentary in nature. I made clear I was keen from the outset to work closely with the parliament to ensure its views were reflected in the bill framework. Contributions to the bill's journey have come in many forms, from the proposal for a member's bill by Neil Finlay, the late Helen Eady's suggestion that the Standards Committee conduct an inquiry into the most appropriate measures required in the Scottish context, the subsequent inquiry, the committee report published in, in February 2015, and of the 17 recommendations in that report, 12 fell within the scope of the bill and were reflected in whole or in part on the bill's introduction. The government's own consultation published in May 2015 maintained the momentum of stakeholder engagement, and that momentum continued after the bill's introduction with the committee's call for evidence. The stage one report published in December 2015 and the endorsement of the general principles of the bill all 13 recommendations in that report had been or were um, actioned by the government and, of course, the contributions made by members during the bill's parliamentary passage. All of these steps evidence the collaborative working between the government and the parliament, indicative of the Scottish democratic process of which we are rightly proud. President Officer, the, that collaborative working has, been important, has impor importantly involved stakeholders who have helped to shape the product um, to make sure that the project will work for lobbyists, for businesses and organisations, for transparency campaign groups, and most importantly, for citizens. As a result of that engagement, including the... Of course. Neil Finlay. On a scale of 1 to 10, in comparison with other jurisdictions, we are in, level, in terms of the level of transparency would the Minister see the bill set? I, I think the, the bill sits absolutely in the correct place in a balance between transparency and proportionality for the Scottish, for the Scottish circumstances, going back to Helen Eady's um, initial request for the, the Standards Committee to look at, at, at that issue. As a result of that engagement, including the numerous stakeholders meetings I've had, the bill has, that is in front of us, uh, responded positively to a range of interests involved. I respect the position of members and stakeholders who have called for greater transparency and I would emphasise that the Government has listened and has strengthened the Bill during its parliamentary passage. 
I welcome the positive uh, contribution of the lobbying industry who have embraced the principle of greater transparency and accepted the principle of the registrations framework. I've listened to their calls for a level playing field and I think we have achieved that. I've also listened to the concerns of the third and voluntary sectors. As a result, I've tried to ensure a proportionate approach to the regime by ensuring there is not an undue burden placed on small organisations in this sector who, I think, do all they can to better the lives of people of Scotland. I've listened to business through the representative bodies who have called for a simple approach that is easy to operate, um, all with the aim of ensuring that there is free and open relationship between elected members and businesses who serve our communities. That has always been balanced against our aim for, of greater transparency. I've listened to trade unions through their contributions to the government's consultation and the parliamentary inquiry. And of course, in respect of the issue of widening the definition of regulated lobbying to include civil servants. And I'll say more about that later. And importantly, I've listened to the public through representations uh, to their elected members and to me. I was clear at outset this regime should not seek to catch individuals communicating on their own behalf. This was based on the important principle of retaining engagement between the government and the parliament with constituents and members of the public. Presiding officer, in June 2013, when the government announced it would introduce a lobbying bill, we set out three underpinning principles which guided the development of the bill. First, this parliament has a proud reputation for its um, approach to openness, ease of access and accountability, and the relationship it has built with Civic Scotland, all of which I was clear sh there should be no erosion of. Secondly, I was clear the register of lobbyists should complement and not duplicate existing transparency measures and should, should be developed to work alongside existing frameworks established within the Parliament and the Government. And finally, the new arrangements should be proportionate, simple in their operation and command broad support within and out with the Parliament. The key words I have consistently used are proportionality and simplicity. These three underpinning principles have been welcomed by members and stakeholders and are clearly reflected in the bill before us. During stage one, the stage one debate, every member who contributed to the debate agreed that lobbying is a legitimate activity and recognised the valuable contribution it makes to informing policy in Scotland. But we agreed we should seek to increase transparency of lobbying activity, particularly in light of the further devolution of powers to the Scottish Parliament. The bill we have before us will aid existing transparency measures in a robust and coherent manner. Throughout the bill's development, I've said I would continue to consider any potential amend changes to the bill as long as they retained the principle of proportionality. And I thank members for their amendments and recognise there might be some disappointment that some changes were not endorsed by the committee and the parliament. The amendments the government has brought forward and, were, and which were agreed to were carefully considered on the basis of the views of parliament and stakeholders. On a number of fronts, particularly on the subject of written communications, I have not been assured that changes would um, respect the, the principle of proportionality. Robert Cumming um, of PA Advocacy undertook his third annual advocacy survey of MSPs recently. His analysis of evidence shows most MSPs rely on direct communications with organisations by way of meeting in the first instance. That evidence supports the government position that face-to-face -face communications is the most effective means of lobbying. At stage two, the committee agreed to a government amendment to add a provision to the bill requiring that Parliament should report on the operation of the Act. We feel it's, a, it's appropriate for Parliament to review the types of communication covered and other aspects of the scope of the regime in the light of experience of the Act. This will allow the Parliament to suggest any changes on an evidence base founded on practical experience of operating a lobbying register. There are already provisions in the bill that allow for the parliament to make changes by resolution to the operation, operational aspects of the regime. Both, um, but both provisions focus on experience and in, in, in evidence gathering in, information, any in, in informing any proposals for change. Members have consistently called for engagement with elected representatives to be protected. In, and in particular by small organisations and businesses and to ensure that the regime does not interfere with the engagement we have on a daily basis with our constituents. The bill will not undermine the Parliament's strong reputation for accessibility nor of the government that the First Minister committed to leading when she came to office. 
That is why I brought forward the amendments relating to ex uh, exceptions for constituency-based activity and communications by small organisations and businesses, which I outlined earlier. The First Amendment exempts communications from organisations on their own behalf to either the constituency or list MSP um, for the place where the organisation carries out its business or where the individual making the communication on behalf of the organisation is a resident, regardless of where the meetings take place. This amendment clearly reflects the wishes of Parliament not to interfere with the communication we have with our constituents. Yes, of course. Patricia Ferguson. I understand what the Minister is saying, and none of us would disagree with, with where he's trying to get to. But I would just say to him, what the, the bill as amended today actually says is that you're exempted if you speak to someone uh, who represents the area where you work. You're exempted if you speak to the person or the... Or the, the raft of MSPs who represent the area where you live and you're also exempted uh, in speaking to those people who represent the area where you have activity. I don't know what activity is, maybe the Minister could clarify that, but that just seems to me to be excluding far too many people. If you draw to a close too, please, Minister, shortly. What, what we've tried to do is to, 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 to get a balance, and the, the, the balance we've tried to do, I think, reflects the work of a constituency member. Certainly, if a business comes to me which either operates in in my constituency or um, the, the, the person coming to me is one of my constituents, then I take that as something that I can deal with as a constituency member. Remember, this exemption will not um, apply, however, to ministers. Second Amendment, establish an exemption in respect of any organisation that has fewer than 10 full-time equivalent employees. Uh, any communication on, made on its own behalf will not require the organisation to register under the, the bill. And I'll quickly move to conclusion, presiding officer. Um, President Officer, I hope members will agree that the bill, as amended, achieves the aim we set out at the outset of this process, a bill which most folk in this chamber can stand behind. The collaborative relationship between the government, the parliament and our stakeholders throughout the development of this bill is yet another example that supports the proud reputation for an open engagement with Civic Scotland that, is, that this parliament and this government have. I commend the bill to parliament and hope that members will support it at decision time. Thank you so much. Now I call on Neil Finlay. Up six minutes, please, Mr Finlay. <coughs> President Officer, I don't think the Minister believed a word of that, I'm afraid, because this is not one of this Parliament's finest days. Yeah. It's a day of mixed feelings for me. In one sense, I'm pleased that three years after uh, introducing the Lobbying and, Lobby and Transparency Scotland Bill, today this Parliament will at least legislate for some mm -hmm. form of regulation of lobbying. But mixed feelings because... This is not a robust bill that I envisaged three years ago. That bill sought to open up our democracy to greatly increase mm -hmm. transparency and accountability. And from the day I introduced the bill, I got the impression uh, that the minister would rather have stuck pins in his eyes than legislate pr properly to regulate lobbying. And we know why. Because it's in the interests of any governing party for people not to know what is really going on, who they are meeting, what they're meeting about, who is influencing policies, who is schmoozing ministers and MSPs, civil servants and special advisors, whose friends and contacts are in the right places and the right businesses and civic society. But the public want to know and have the right to know what has been done in their name. They want to know. Yeah. Prior, prior to this um, bill coming forward, ministers have um, recorded the meetings that they, that they have, and, and, and that was always a way to have transparency. One of the other, we're moving into an election, one of the other groups of people who are being, being lobbied to impact on um, manifestos are advisors to the leaders of the opposition. Will the leader, leaders of the opposition publish the, the, the meetings that their advisors are having? Neil Finley? <laughs> Minister, I mean, you talk about going way off the tangent here. Um, I'm all up for, for openness and transparency, and the more we have it, the better. But, but that's... The, well, listen, we'll, we'll come to some of these issues in a moment. Um, the public want to know and have the right to know what's been done in their name. They should know whether dealings with Donald Trump, Jim Ratcliffe, Brian Souter, or whoever, results in contracts being won, policies being changed or decisions taken or indeed not taken. So for the executive, lobby and transparency is something they do not want. Currently we see the government using freedom of information exemptions, often ludicrously, to hide their, their dealings on fracking, to cover up their developing links with Qatar. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, 
I realise the member didn't attend all the evidence sessions of the committee, but if he had, he would have heard uh, representatives of the major lobbying organisations saying they were uh, entirely welcoming uh, the opportunity that registering their, action would, their actions uh, would give them to publicise the value of the work that they do. Now, I don't endorse that as a particular view, but we did hear many organisations involved in lobbying welcoming what's happening. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, and I bet none of them puts forward some of the nonsensical amendments that we've heard today. But we are here at UCN yeah. FOI exemption being used to prevent um, uh, people finding out information on things like the future of hospital services. And we see the use and absolute abuse of the parliamentary question system to dish out pathetic non-answers uh, to the concerns we raise on behalf of our constituents. A real failure in our democracy that has gone completely unchecked in this parliament. All of this designed to prevent the release of information and the lobbying bill is just another inconvenience. The reality is that this bill's torturous journey it does not show this parliament in a good light. From the minute the government grudgingly took it over, I've never been convinced that they were actually serious about transparency. Initially, they did nothing for almost two years. The minister hoping somehow that it would all just go away. And then despite denials, they asked the committee to hold inquiry, then a committee debate, then a consultation, then more delay, then we had a further debate in the committee report. By the time, in a moment, by the time we had, uh, this had all happened, the bill was watered down to the bowl of rather meagre gruel that the minister brings to the table today. I think for, for the record, we should clarify that it was the late Helen Eady that requested that the Standards Committee take forward an inquiry. And we also had the government asking the current uh, convener to uh, host the inquiry, and you've confirmed that in the letter that you sent to me. Uh, the bill was watered down to such an extent that when we attended an expert seminar on the bill at Stirling University, a US professor of public policy, an authority on lobbying, said the US system gets a 6 out of 10 for transparency. Mm -hmm. This bill gets a 2 at best. And of course, since then, the bill has gotten a whole lot worse mm -hmm. with some of the ridiculous amendments put forward by the minister today. A minister who has shown zero interest or enthusiasm or indeed knowledge of this issue since day one. The bill in its present form is as, as, a, as clear a statement as anyone could wish for that this government has no interest in enhancing the principles of openness, transparency and account accountability that this parliament was supposedly founded upon. I'm afraid that these are now tokenistic words that fail to match the reality for the public and their representatives searching for answers to serious questions. After nine years in government, the SNP are Scotland's new establishment, more interested in protecting their associations, their networks, their web of helpful connections that they have built up in that time and to look as though, at the same time as look as though they are up for scrutiny, while in reality closing it down at every turn. If the minister's remit from the first minister to was, was to make the bill tokenistic, weak and full of loopholes, then he has passed that test mm. with flying colours, but it is not something that he should be proud of. When this bill passes, he will have done his party proud, but this parliament will have missed a major opportunity to reform our democracy for the better. President officer, we will support this bill despite it being woefully inadequate because it gets, at least gets lobbying on the statute book. But we will, we will seek to amend almost every element of it at the first opportunity of review in the next parliament to make it fit for purpose. Because a bill that fails to recognise we live in an electronic age, a bill that means the CBI and the Institute of Directors and others are not covered, and a bill that allows the political elite to use their contact books for commercial advancement without scrutiny is a bill that is not fit for purpose. Thank you very much. Now call on Cameron Buchanan. Four minutes, Mr Buchanan, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think I can answer that point, first of all, that it, the IOD and other groups are covered by this bill because they're a big, they're a big organisation. It's definitely our intention in the committee to cover these big organisations. Anyway, I think we can also agree that it's important to have a democratic system that is open, transparent, and tra certainly. The Neil understanding Finley. from the research that I've, I've seen is that they're not a big enough organisation. They don't have enough employees to be covered. Cameron McKenna. 
Thank you. They have members, not necessarily employees, but they have members, and that's the same sort of thing. They're big. Sorry. Moving on. Thank you. There is nothing too contentious about that. There has been a vigorous debate on some details of the bill, with important points to consider on a range of issues, including the scope of communications, including and information returns required. For our part, we have kept a clear focus on ensuring that the system of registration delivers transparency whilst remaining light touch in its approach, and that's the key word I've been using all the time. Furthermore, it must be clear to any potential registrants what would be required of them, so we have a collaborative environment rather than the payday for lawyers. With this in mind, I'd like to touch on some of the changes that were proposed for this bill and how they fit in with the overarching principles of proportionality. The question of which types of communication should be included as regulated lobbying is, of course, hugely influential on the overall scope of the bill. So it is entirely right that we've had an extensive debate on what qualifies. We do recognise the motivation behind the arguments that include emails and phone calls within the definition of regulated lobbying. But we must always consider the wider need for proportionality and targeted provisions. It is apparent that including all forms of communication will place a large ongoing burden on both registrants and the clerks operating the system. We all know that the volume of emails sent and received can be huge in just one day, let alone over a period of months. A requirement to register all of these would, I think, be clearly difficult and costly for registrants, as well as making information received by the clerk less targeted. I say targeted for two reasons. Firstly, the duties imposed on this bill must be proportionate, and I keep referring to this point, as to the benefits to be gained. As we've acknowledged before, thankfully, our political system has not been troubled by lobbying scandals. This, the benefit of this bill is therefore targeted to some extent at a potential rather than existing problem of undue influence, which we should bear in mind when assessing the costs that we can justify imposing on organisations, businesses and members of the public. Secondly, we've heard face-to-face -face meetings can be more influential or important than emails or phone calls. This also makes it apparent that capturing the information would provide a useful insight into lobbying practices without imposing the large burdens on registrants that would make a register counterproductive. The question, again, in my mind, is proportionality. As for the question of disclosing financial information as part of the returns, it remains apparent that requiring this would be counterproductive and, disproportionate, and a disproportionate method, measure. The first point to make is that assigning expenditure to specific activities could be a very difficult and resource-intensive burden for organisations, particularly small ones, to comply with, leading to confusion and unwelcome obstacles. In addition, there remain, remains significant issues in terms of commercial sensitivity and confidentiality. The effect of these concerns is that enforcing financial disclosure would impose negatives that outweigh the positives. For the register to be effective, it must increase the transparency of our policy making without compromising its strength. This means that we must ensure that the openness of our politics is not weakened through either confusion or bureaucracy. Forcing registrants to disclose financial information, I think, fails this test. I think the point about maintaining the strength of our policy is the key. We rightly pride ourselves on an open and accessible political system, particularly here in this chamber, which not only supports public engagement, also allows more informed decisions to be made. I do not believe that anyone would want to see elected politicians making policy decisions without information from the experts, and I think we must guard against such unwanted outcomes. The principles of openness and transparency go hand in hand and must therefore underline each aspect of the bill, including the matter of implementation, on which I will elaborate later. Thank you. Thanks very much. We now move to the open debate and I call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, very much Presiding Officer. And, uh, we've made several references to Helen Eady in this debate and I think it's the affection with it which we, she has held that uh, over lunch only today uh, a number of us were uh, reminiscing about her contributions uh, to, to this parliament and wider political debate. Uh, perhaps those of us on the yes side in the Euro campaign will particularly miss her enthusiastic uh, uh, European-ism. Uh, um, before I get to the substance of it, let me just uh, report the result of extensive debate, uh, extensive research I've undertaken and since Mr Finlay uh, spoke, lasting approximately 75 seconds. I can tell him that uh, far from the CBI employing less than 10 people, it employs 14 directors alone before you even get to any other 
employed staff at the CBI have. So if he asserts, as he did in his contribution, that the CBI are excluded because they employ fewer than 10 people, he is quite frankly uh, factually wrong. The web address, we can check this and you'll get the list of names, is news.cbi.org.uk, which will give him a list. And I, I think that characterises uh, a lot of the assertions that have been uh, untested assertions. We've also, during the debate on the amendments, on a number of occasions, Mr Finlay uh, suggested that we should reject amendments uh, from the government. Uh, in response to the development of the bill, as it's gone through the parliamentary process, and at each stage we learn more and should respond, on the basis that the committee didn't take any evidence. But it didn't inhibit Mr Finlay himself uh, from bringing forward a whole series of amendments uh, which were well outside the information that the committee engage with during its research, uh, for example, on offences and sanctions. But let's not go into too great detail. I very much welcome this bill. Um, he, the, Mr Finlay, of course, was correct in saying that an American uh, professor at a seminar at the University of Stirling did say this bill ranked two out of ten. Uh, what he failed to inform colleagues in the Parliament, of course, is that when I then interacted with the Professor, uh, I discovered that his understanding of the bill was substantially incomplete and uh, that he accepted that the 2 out of 10 was based on an entire misunderstanding of where the bill was coming from. A couple of things in the bill that I think are uh, worth looking at uh, that uh, are, 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 are things that we should put on the record. First of all, I think we've not made the mistake of, in this bill, looking at registering lobbyists, but at lobbying and the people who undertake it. And I think uh, perhaps Westminster, in looking at uh, its registration involving consultant lobbyists, uh, has missed the, the proper target. This bill focuses on the activity of lobbying, and I think that's all well and good. I think one of the gems in the bill that is very useful is voluntary registration. Uh, that allows bodies who are uncertain or anticipate in future they might want to get engaged in substantial lobbying to choose uh, to register even though there is no objective evidence at the time of registration that they are required to do so. And I think that's a very strong part of the bill. Second part that's uh, very good about the bill is that you can lobby first and then register afterwards. Because in many instances, the interaction between someone who is lobbying and the person who is being lobbied uh, will not initially have the character of lobbying. It develops during the discussion. So that 30-day period is very much welcome. Uh, I welcome this. It's, uh, for me, not a huge issue, but not an insubstantial issue. I estimate I'll have four interactions between now and uh, the, uh, the dissolution of Parliament that I would categorise as people coming uh, to lobby me. This is a very substantial way forward. In Parliament, we look forward to exercising the powers that we are given under Section 15 to draw up the details uh, for the register, which our successors in office will be doing in the next session of Parliament. Presiding officer. Thanks. And I call on Patricia Ferguson. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And um, I have to say that I rise to speak in this debate with a feeling of some dismay about the bill we're passing today. And I say that as someone who was not initially a supporter of the idea of there being a lobbying bill. In fact, as colleagues, some colleagues at least know, um, because I've told them so in the Standards Committee in the first session of the Parliament, I was one of those who made the decision that we wouldn't have back then any kind of regulation of lobbying. But I am in favour of a lobbying bill now and I'd like to explain to the Chamber why that is. As a member of the Standards and Public Appointments Committee I decided that I would keep an open mind and listen to the arguments and the evidence before coming to a decision about whether or not I would vote for a lobbying bill. I listened very intently and with great interest to the evidence that we heard from a number of eminent people with great experience in this area. People who had helped to shape legislation in other countries, people who were advocates for greater transparency in politics, and from people who lobbied for a living. We also heard from charities and the voluntary sector and discussed with them their concerns and the points that they thought were right. We as a committee then debated what we had heard and drew up our stage one report. 
We made a number of recommendations to the government about ways in which the bill could and should be improved. Many of those ideas have been debated today, so I won't rehash them now. But it became clear that the Scottish Government wasn't going to take on board our recommendations, so I tabled amendments to give effect to some of the committee's Stage 1 report. And I should say that at this point, I still wasn't entirely sure that we needed a lobbying bill. But I was absolutely sure that if we were going to have one, it needed to be the best bill it could possibly be. And to my mind, excluding communications other than face-to-face -face communications, and I am rehashing what I said earlier, but I make no apology for it, is absolutely ludicrous in the 21st century. Yep. But at stage two, perhaps unsurprisingly, all of my amendments were voted down mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that they simply reflected the views of the committee in its stage one report. How that can happen in a parliament like this, I leave others to consider. Once again today, similar amendments were voted down. Now, while we were in committee scrutinising the bill, my colleague Neil Finlay tried to obtain information through the FOI system about ministers' engagement with lobbying companies. Most of the information requested could not be supplied because to do so would take the cost over the £600 threshold. I do wonder whether the Scottish Government needs to look at the system that it uses for recording such information to see if it can't have a proper search facility that would allow it to actually abstract that information more easily and, crucially, more cheaply. But gradually and over time, I came to the conclusion that a lobbying bill was required because, in principle, people should know what their elected members do and who has influence over them. And it also seemed to me that this government was somehow going out of its way to ensure that this bill would be as ineffectual as possible. And I really genuinely do not understand why it would want to do that. Now, I want to just take up a point that Patrick Harvey made earlier in the debates on amendments. Mr Harvey uh, made the point that we should, at this stage, include other categories of civil servants, as my amendment had suggested, and that if that was found to be too onerous or that it didn't work, we could, when we reviewed it, reduce the numbers, but that until we had the information, we couldn't make that judgment. Now, that amendment was defeated, but it is not beyond the Scottish Government to record that information internally and to be able to feed that information into the review when the review happens, because it will only be by having that kind of information that Parliament will be able to make a properly informed judgment. And I wonder if the Minister would consider that today. Now, Mr Fitzpatrick has made great play about the idea of the bill having to be proportionate. I absolutely agree with that. We all want to be transparent and open, and we want our constituents to have as much and as easy access to us as is possible. What we disagree about is the way in which that should be handled through this bill. What we've ended up with is a complicated labyrinthine bill that I think will possibly do more harm than good. I genuinely hope it doesn't, but I think that might be the case. But it is the passage Daughter, of this close, bill... Please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is the very passage of this bill that has made me think that lobbying bill is needed. The problem is that it's not this bill. This is a pay limitation of the robust bill a parliament like this should have. And I sincerely hope that when the bill is reviewed in the next parliamentary session, that there is a government and a parliament that isn't afraid of transparency and openness, but will embrace it and create a new bill close, which is please. proportionate and does what it says in the tin, because this one doesn't. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now Colin Cameron McCannon. Four minutes, please, Mr McCannon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The level of transparency in our government and its openness to the public are both crucial aspects of a healthy democracy, which does make it so important that we get this lobbying bill right. I've always maintained that if this bill is to be effective, it must take, as I said earlier, the proportionate approach that increases transparency in our decision-making process without deterring participation in the first place. It appears that after much deliberation, we've reached a point where the correct balance, in our opinion, has been struck. I'm pleased to say that we Scottish Conservatives will therefore be supporting the bill at decision time. It's therefore also been right to seek a collaborative approach to this legislation, which is worth bearing in mind as we consider how to ensure that the potential registrants and the wider public are ready for the provisions coming into force. It is essential that provisions imposed by the lobbying bill are clearly understood so that they do not create any distinctive 
disincentive from participation in public decision making. A long-term principle of our democratic process is that the wider range of views heard in a policy making, the better therefore the policy will be. As I've therefore said before, lobbying is not about closed door deals between vested interests and powerful decision makers, but actually about the fundamental matter of having an open political process of which all manner of ideas, views and contributions are welcome. Indeed, wide-ranging participation is crucial to a healthy democracy. It should therefore be clear that organisations and members of the public should be free to discuss the matters of interest with their electoral representatives and feel it is they are hassle-free to do so. I've already underlined how important it has been to keep this in mind throughout our deliberations on the scope of the register. I would like to take this chance to emphasise the need to continue promoting openness and any requirements that come into force. A crucial aspect of maintaining openness and accessibility is the availability of help or guidance to assist potential registrants. The aim, after all, is to increase transparency and not to catch anyone out. I was therefore very pleased to see that my amendment requiring the publication of guidance on the operation of the register is passed at stage two. Such guidance is simply too important to be discretionary, and we must therefore ensure that it is clear, thorough, and targeted in its explanations of what counts as regulated lobby and what does not count as regulated lobby. What any ongoing requirements are, ideally, what any ongoing requirements are, Ideally, it would re remove the need for complex compliance operations or expensive lawyers so that we can all get on with the business of conducting politics in an open way, which all parties support. Furthermore, putting in an effort to have a clear collaborative process in place would, I think, minimise the chance of stakeholders simply pulling out of the public decision-making process, as well as decreasing the likelihood, the likelihood of unintentional mistakes in compliance. If we do achieve such a collaborative culture around lobbying, I believe we'd have struck the optimal situation where our, all our processes are transparent and maintain their strength through accessibility. I'm pleased to say that the bill as it now stands, I think, appears to reach the balance, and we Scottish Conservatives therefore put our support behind it. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Mary Fee, up to five minutes, Mrs Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour supports the principle of a, a lobbying bill and the need for introduction of legislation. However, we do believe, despite voting for it at decision time tonight, we do believe that the bill in its current form should have been amended further to ensure <coughs> that it is a strong and effective piece of legislation. <coughs> the bill in front of us today is a dilution of my colleague Neil Finlay's original proposal of a lobbying bill. And as we have heard, there are two key areas where we believe that the bill falls short, and those are by excluding emails and by excluding all civil servants except permanent secretary secretaries. It is a mistake and it renders the bill almost <coughs> meaningless. And the passing of this bill will lead to a situation where only one civil servant for each Scottish Government department, the permanent secretary, will be captured by this <coughs> bill, and this is an obvious failing. And presiding officer, at stage two, when the bill was in committee, Scottish Labour lodged 16 amendments, but each and every one of them was rejected, as the SNP used their majority on the committee to reject all the alternatives proposed by Scottish Labour. And the Scottish Labour <coughs> amendments, in the name of my colleagues Neil Finlay and Patricia Ferguson, aimed to strengthen the bill in the key areas of accountability, transparency and openness. And the result of every Scottish Labour amendment being rejected at stage two is a lobbying bill that is not as strong as a, or as effective as we would have liked the bill to be. Scottish <coughs> Labour would like to have the bill significantly strengthened to ensure that the legislation <coughs> is as strong and effective as possible. And as well as not addressing the concerns raised by members of this parliament, the Scottish Government has not considered the views of Civic Scotland in relation to this bill either. Organisation after organisation and expert after expert have criticised this bill for not being as strong as it possibly could be, yet the SNP have taken little action to strengthen the bill to make it a truly effective and workable piece of legislation. For example, Unlock Democracy described the current definition of lobbying in the bill as a gift to those who might wish to keep their activity out of the public gaze. Research has shown that the public overwhelmingly want greater transparency in Holyrood, but they are still waiting for MSPs to deliver rather than give in to the lobbying industry. It would be farcical and ironic if the bill to regulate lobbying were to be neutered because MSPs have been lobbied 
by the lobbyists. And, presiding officer, these are not my words, but the words of Robert Barrington, Executive Director of Transparency International UK. And I think that members across this chamber should reflect on this statement by Robert Barrington. In 1999, when the Scottish Parliament was established, it had the explicit founding values of accountability, transparency and openness. And in a time where public confidence in politicians is failing, we should be aiming harder than ever to inspire faith among the people of Scotland and their elected representatives. This is why we in Scottish Labour passionately believe in strengthening the lobbying bill to make it a strong and effective piece of legislation. We understand the need for a lobbying bill and we support the proposal for the introduction of a lobbying bill. We want the bill to be strong in lobbying, strong in transparency and strong on accountability. And the government talks frequently in the chamber about being a listening government and about being consensual. And speakers in this afternoon's debates have raised concerns about the legislation, about the need to strengthen it. And this was a perfect opportunity for the SNP government to do exactly that. It's just a pity that they decided not to listen. And at points today, I have wondered if we've been discussing two different bills. Because the bill that I look at is not the bill that the SNP are talking about. There is a need for a lobbying bill. And this is why we will support the passing of the bill. But the Scottish Government must listen to the concerns of parliamentarians, independent organisations and experts alike and take action to ensure that the lobbying bill meets the aspirations of this Parliament in providing accountability, openness and transparency through strong and effective lobbying legislation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I we'll now call on the Minister Joe Fitzpatrick to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government Minister up to seven minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the fact that members have subjected the lobbying bill to close scrutiny throughout its parliamentary passage and today has been uh, no difference. Um, maybe I should first of all, I, I'm not somebody who has got thin skin or whatever, but some of the comments from Mr Finlay I, I thought went a, a, bit, a bit deep and were, were verging on nasty offensive comments. So in defence of myself, perhaps I should read some of the comments that um, SALT have published today in response to the amendments that we've passed um, this, this afternoon. So Willie Sullivan, Director of Electoral Reform Society, said, we are delighted the Minister has responded in this way. Now, I know that, that SALT and the SALT members want to go, to go further than we have done, and he then confirms that, while we still will have some concerns about the bill, particularly their desire for face-to-face -face meetings being, and email calls to be recorded. Um, but we are sure the bill, when enacted, will increase public visibility of lobbying. He then goes on to say, with built-in two-year review of new lobby register should provide a firm basis of good evidence for the Parliament to include emails, etc. following on. So a positive comment there. Uh, Rob McAlpine, um, also a member of SALT from the Common Wheel, um, this legislation is still not as strong as, as we'd liked, but the Scottish Government have been listening and we've definitely made progress. Above all, there is a commitment that this is a foundation which can be built on for the future Parliament. Hopefully, Scotland is moving um, towards a system of lobbying transparency it can be proud of. So, um, positive comments from some of the people who have been pushing for maximum transparency, and um, I, I think it, I, I certainly welcome those comments um, going forward. Um, a couple of, couple of comments that have, that, that have been raised. Uh, Neil Finlay um, asked, um, suggested that the CBI would somehow be exempt because he reckoned they had less than 10 um, full-time equivalents who worked in Scotland. So let me just be absolutely clear about the, the amendments that we passed today. First of all, um, the exemption is not based on the number of staff working in Scotland. It's based on the number of staff working for the organisation, irrespective of where that is irrespective of, of location um, and secondly of course we put beyond doubt the, 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 the fact that representative bodies are excluded from the, the, that, that exclusion. Um, Patricia Ferguson um, asked about the, the, this, the, whether, whether we would look at um, monitoring um, the amount of information, the amount of contact with senior civil servants to inform a future review of the bill. And, I, mean, I think that's, that's something that, that, that we can look at. But of course, as I said in stage two, that any um, ch changes we wish to make in terms of senior civil servants, we would have to discuss with the, with the trade unions and we'd have to evidence why that was um, an appropriate um, step forward and, and we didn't manage to achieve that um, 
at, at this stage. I mentioned in my opening speech the government's desire to achieve as much consensus as is possible um, for establishment of register of lobbying activity in Scotland. And I, I, I think we, we've achieved that. And I think some of the comments, particularly from SALT, the positive comments there, um, show that, that we have made, made progress in pulling together people from all sides of the argument. Um, so initially, um, some of the, the organisations like the Federation of Small Businesses were very critical of, of um, what we've done. But I, I hope that they now see that we have um, a, a bill um, and we will future, in future have an act which, as uh, Cameron Buchanan says, is proportionate um, in, in, in moving forward. So it gives us that increased transparency um, without being overly burdensome. Um, the bill, um, I think in the main, although some of the comments today might suggest differently, I, I think has generally been developed in a positive climate um, of Scottish democracy and the, the engagement that I have had with stakeholders on all sides um, has been positive and I think it's a sign that that public engagement remains um, as strong as ever in, in this and, and that dynamic in support of the openness of this parliament. Um, the government doesn't want this bill to discourage public engagement in, in Scotland's politics and we've kept that principle firmly in mind when promoting measures aimed at increasing transparency. The term striking a balance uh, might seem a uh, cliche, but the extensive coverage of this bill highlights the importance of getting that balance right and giving close consideration to the wider implications of any policy proposals. Um, I'd like to put on record my thanks to the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Stuart Stevenson and his committee have devoted a significant proportion of their time uh, this session helping um, to develop thinking on our, on our, our, our approach. Um, the successor committee will, of course, be heavily involved in implementing processes for the lobbying register and there, therefore today is only part of a careful and methodical process. I'd also wish to, to, to thank um, a wide range of stakeholders who have taken the time to engage with me and my office over the past three years. Um, that engagement has ensured the government um, has been well informed um, of contrasting views and ideas and helped us to reach a proportionate balance. I'd lastly like to, to thank my bill team who um, have been working on this, I think, for some three years. Um, and and I, I want to put on record my thanks to them in, in helping me bring forward and present a bill which I am very proud of and I think will do this Parliament proud. I consider this bill, as, now, uh, as it's now framed, in, is coherent and, above all, proportionate an, uh, initial framework for the registration of lobbying activity in Scotland. Once again, I ask members to join me in supporting the passage of the Lobbying Scotland Bill at decision time. Thank you. Many thanks. And that concludes the debate on the Lobbying Scotland Bill. And it's now, and thank you. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a point of order from Mr. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Thank Kelly. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I wish to make a point of order covering uh, 8.17.1 of the standing orders in relation to the publication of yesterday's government expenditure and revenue statistics. As a result of an error in the calculation of the oil reserve figures, the data released yesterday was incorrect. Uh, indeed, the government has now had to publish two further revisions uh, of these statistics. And as they have been uh, subject to both parliamentary and public debate, I think it's a real matter of concern that we're now on to the third version of these figures. I would therefore ask, Deputy Presiding Officer, that you ensure that the Deputy First Minister makes a statement to par Parliament confirming that all uh, stakeholders have been advised of these corrections and that the latest, latest version of the statistics is complete and accurate. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr Kelly, for your point of order. Um, what I would say is that publications of JER's figures are entirely a matter for the government. Uh, corrections to them in my view, are also a matter for the government. However, uh, you have made your point, but I don't think it's a point of order. If Mr Swinney wants to address it at this time, then he's not offering to do so. So um, we will leave it at that. Thank you for making the point, but it's not a point of order. Now move on to the next item of business, which is stage three proceedings on the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill. And in dealing with... I'm sorry, is there a problem? Right, thank you, Ms Bailey. The next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill, 
and in dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at stage two and the marshal list in the groupings. The division bill will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the proceedings. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds thereafter. I allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group, and members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments, and I now call on Group 1 and, and call Amendment 1 in the name of the Deputy First Minister. Groups Amendments 2 to 6, 8, 9, 12, 15 to 18, 20, 21 and 22. Deputy First Minister, to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Officer, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to these amendments. The fiscal framework requires the Scottish Fiscal Commission to prepare forecasts of tax revenues, demand-led social security expenditure and Scottish GDP. We currently have competence to legislate for Commission functions based on the fiscal powers devolved to the Scottish Parliament under the Scotland Acts of 1998 and 2012. We therefore propose these amendments to provide that the Scottish Fiscal Commission should prepare rolling five-year forecasts of receipts of fully devolved taxes which will initially cover land and buildings transaction tax and Scottish landfill tax and in due course further taxes wholly devolved to the Scottish Parliament including air passenger duty and aggregates levy, receipts from non-domestic rates and receipts from the Scottish rate of income tax. The Non-Statutory Commission currently has a role in scrutinising the economic determinants of the Scottish Government's forecast of non-domestic rate receipts. The agreement reached in the fiscal framework covers the entirety of the NDR forecast and Amendment 1 also caters for this change in function. Amendment 22 ensures that the Commission will have direct statutory rights of access to the data held by the Scottish assessors and by local authorities, which it will require to prepare NDR forecasts. The Commission's existing function in relation to borrowing has been retained. The Commission will, continu will continue to be required to prepare reports setting out its assessment of the reasonableness of Scottish Minister's projections of borrowing requirements. We further propose that the Commission should retain the general function currently provided for in Section 2.3 of the Bill, which enables it to undertake work on other fiscal matters in addition to its specific functions. Amendments 2 and 3 are intended to ensure that this flexibility reflects the Commission's new statutory functions. The purpose of Amendment 8 is to require the Commission to provide the Scottish Ministers with forecasts in sufficient time to support finalisation of the Scottish Budget. The prior notification... Brown. I just wonder if, if at this stage does he have a view on what he means by sufficient time? Is it a day, a week, a month or does he not have a view at this stage? The, in, in reality, I suspect the uh, time is probably um, less than two weeks before the date of the budget would be my view, but it's not, that, that will not be specified. And Of course, in the Memorandum of Understanding, which I suspect will uh, be deployed to um, inform relationships between the Government and the Fiscal Commission on Working Practices, we can perhaps shed more detail on that. But that would be a point where obviously the Commission would be... Um, uh, the Commission would be uh, fully empowered to determine what they thought to be um, reasonable in that context. The prior notification is essential to the Scottish Budget process as the Commission's forecast will determine the overall resources available to deploy in that budget. The timing of uh, this advance access to forecasts will be specified in the protocol as I've indicated to Mr Brown and as provided for in Section 4A. Amendment 9 adjusts the process for laying reports before Parliament in consequence of the change to the forecasting model. The purpose of Amendment 12 is to dispense with the requirement on the Commission to provide the Scottish Ministers with a copy of a report prepared under Section 2.1, where it has already been sent by virtue of the changes introduced by Amendment 8. Amendments 15 to 18 are technical consequential amendments reflecting the shift to the forecasting functions in Amendment. The purpose of Amendments 20 and 21 is to protect the core forecasting function as set out in the new Section 2A1 uh, from being removed through regulations. This means that primary legislation would be required to remove the general forecasting function from the Commission. These amendments create a statutory framework which could be added to by regulations as the competence of the Scottish Parliament is expanded by the Scotland Act 2016. We have undertaken to consult on the scope of the Commission's expanded powers and will bring forward a timetable for doing so after the Bill is passed. 
I move Amendment 1 and invite Parliament to agree to the remaining amendments in this group. Many thanks. Now call on Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak in support of Amendment 1 and all the other amendments in this group, and I very much welcome and support all of the amendments. Scottish Labour first argued we should have the Fiscal Commission produce the official forecast in January 2015. We supported the Finance Committee's view, reached after something like two years of deliberation, that the Fiscal Commission should do the official forecast. And I have to say, it's one of the best reports produced by the committee, and I commend those involved, in particular the convener, who said, we are strongly of the view that not only should the Fiscal Commission be independent, but it is vital it is perceived to be independent. That is why we're calling for the bill to be amended to strengthen the Commission's role and to give it responsibility for producing the official forecast. I think we're all surprised when the bill was introduced. The Cabinet Secretary appeared to have ignored the Finance Committee. He'd ignored his colleagues. It was a pale imitation of what was required. The Government were intent on keeping control. The Commission was not to do the official forecast. And at stage one consideration of the bill, with one exception, um, the Committee maintained its position and rejected the Government's attempt to make the Fiscal Commission a less powerful body. So John Swinney was sent away to think again. To secure the independence of the Fiscal Commission and the robustness of the forecast, we were clear the Commission should be responsible <coughs> for that official forecast. A matter of a few days later, that all changed. SNP members, including the convener, had somehow become converted. Some, less generous than myself, might say they'd been nobbled because suddenly they were convinced of John Swinney's arguments. Was this a case of thumbscrews being applied, or did the convener believe that he had been wrong all along? And I can't ask him that question, because neither Kenny Gibson, the convener, or Mark MacDonald, one of the SNP members, is in the chamber. I'm disappointed that all that work just appeared to be thrown away. But having marched them up to the top of the hill, the Cabinet Secretary abandoned them there as he made a deal with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury that the Fiscal Commission would, contrary to his own view, would now indeed do the official forecasting. Mr Swinney must be positively dizzy with all the about turns he is making, but I do very much welcome them. Presiding officer, it is right that the Fiscal Commission does the official forecasting. As a consequence, it will demonstrate its independence from government. With new powers and new responsibilities coming to this parliament, we must make sure that the institutions we put in place are robust and transparent. These amendments, in the name of John Swinney, help us to do just that. Thank you. Excellent. Now call on Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The journey has indeed been a rich tapestry in relation to fiscal forecasts, but I'm delighted to say that we're getting there in the end. Uh, this is probably the most important change that needed to be made to the bill. It's quite right that official forecasts should be carried out by the Fiscal Commission, not by the Scottish Government. There are a number of reasons for that, but most importantly, they have to be independent forecasts and they have to be seen to be independent. By so doing, these amendments also got rid of, I think, a rather weak reasonableness test, which I don't think was going to uh, offer much scrutiny. It gets rid of the messing about with economic determinants uh, for non-domestic rates and actually looks at the non-domestic rates themselves. And I think it avoids or at least weakens the built-in optimism bias that any government uh, producing forecasts uh, is at risk of producing. And for all of these reasons, I support all of these amendments uh, in the name of John Swinney. As I say, we got there in the end. I was hoping we'd get there at stage two, but I failed to convince uh, the Cabinet Secretary, Deputy Presiding Officer. I just wasn't quite up to the mark of convincing Mr Swinney, but I, I'm glad to say that George Osborne was up to the mark. George Osborne managed to convince John Swinney that this is the right way to go, and I say thank goodness for the persuasive powers of George Osborne. Thanks. Now call on John Mason. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I think I have to say it is no secret that I, as uh, one of the members of the Finance Committee, have not been convinced all along uh, that the SFC should be doing uh, the forecasting. My main reasons for that have been that, uh, one, it is fundamentally better to have one organisation to do the work, in this case forecasting, and a separate organisation to check it. That is what happens with audits, and both auditors and the SFC look to the future and look to the past. Secondly, it is going to be more resource intensive and therefore more expensive to have this kind of duplication of work. Thirdly, 
I am not convinced that the OBR model is that great, and it is certainly in a minority internationally. And fourthly, uh, the question of independence and who does the forecasting are two completely separate issues uh, and should not be conflated. However, I do accept that the bargaining with Westminster over the fiscal framework has meant that we have not got the ideal situation in every case, this being one. I will vote for the amendments to A tonight, but if I'm returned here and it all goes belly up, I will be standing here to say that I said it before. Thank you. <laughs> Deputy First Minister, to wind up and press or withdraw your amendments. Presiding officer, the, the, the first thing I have to say is that, um, you know, well, this to reflect on Jackie Bailey's initial comment, which Jackie Bailey said that she was rising to support the amendments. And I just would like to say, if that was a speech in support, I would hate to see a speech that was not supportive. I suppose that's maybe how the Labour Party goes about its business. Maybe that's how, that's how, they're, they, 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 how they operate in such a, a, a ferret in sack-like mode on a constant basis with Jackie Bailey delivering speeches of support of that nature. Now, I accept this has been uh, a long and winding journey on this particular question. And I want to place on record the resolute consistency of Mr. Mason, who has been absolutely and totally consistent on his arguments throughout this process. But if it wasn't for the fact that the Finance Committee at stage two had voted against these provisions, I would have had nothing to give away in the fiscal <laughs> framework negotiations. And if it came down to a bargain between saving the Scottish budget a Tory attack of £7 billion of cuts to public expenditure and me compromising to uh, put these powers in place, then I thought it was a price worth paying. Uh, of course I'll give way to Mr Brown. Gavin Brown. Mr then encourage or attempt to persuade SNP members on the committee to change their view at stage two? I would, I, I would make absolutely no attempt to try to persuade members of the committee to do anything other than what they thought to be the right thing to do in given circumstances in a parliamentary process. But what we have, uh, of course. Jackie Bailey. Did he perhaps share with them the negotiations that were going on with the fiscal framework? As, ja as Jackie Bailey knows, I have maintained absolute confidence around the con conducting of the negotiations with the Treasury, as was a proper approach for me to take to ensure that these issues were resolved. So, um, Presiding Officer, I'm glad that these amendments seem to command support within the Parliamentary Chamber. Um, they are part of the Fiscal Framework Agreement, which we are putting into place. We want to ensure that all details of the Fiscal Framework are put into practice in the fashion that is envisaged by the Fiscal Framework Agreement. That is precisely what the Scottish Government has placed uh, on the record in these amendments today. And I invite Parliament to support Amendment 1 and when it comes to the appropriate moment to support the other amendments in the group. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Now move to Group 2 and call Amendment 29 in the name of Jackie Bailey in a group on its own. Jackie Bailey to speak to and move Amendment 29. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to move Amendment 29 in my name. This amendment seeks to give the Fiscal Commission responsibility for scrutinising the government's performance against fiscal rules, and secondly, to consider the sustainability of our public finances. In so doing, I have reflected on the Cabinet Secretary's comments at stage two of the bill and the original intentions of the Finance Committee both in their report on fiscal institutions and their stage one report on the bill. Across the world, fiscal institutions have a role in looking at fiscal rules and the future sustainability of public finances. So this is actually nothing new. In the 17 OECD countries that have been researched, 15 have responsibility for looking at the long-term sustainability of public finances. 11 have a role in monitoring compliance with fiscal rules. Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, Portugal indeed, Sweden and the United Kingdom to name but a few. So this is the normal thing for fiscal institutions to do. Now Mr Swinney asked at stage one um, and he's asked since what the fiscal rules are. Now as finance secretary 
I would expect him to know this. But let me just help him here. These are the fiscal rules that are set out in the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act. There are the fiscal rules in relation to capital borrowing, revenue borrowing, the budget exchange mechanism, all of three which will change when the new Scotland Bill becomes an act. The fiscal rules set by the Scottish Government itself, the 5% revenue finance projects cap. And then, then there are the rules set out in the Fiscal Framework Agreement, including the Scotland Reserve. We should be interested in making sure these are scrutinised and reported to Parliament. Let me turn to the sustainability of public finances, because when you consider the International Monetary Fund Fiscal Council data set, you can see that the second most important function of the emerging new generation of fiscal councils is to judge the long-term sustainability of public finances. I don't see why we shouldn't want to do that. The majority of expert witnesses to the committee agreed that both these areas were important. The Scottish Fis Fiscal Commission, in a letter to the committee itself, said that it believes it should have responsibility for assessing the forecast on the sustainability of Scotland's public finances, such as adherence to fiscal rules, and it would welcome the bill being amended now to anticipate this additional responsibility. Indeed, Professor Hughes Hallett, a member of the Commission, said in evidence to the committee that the bill should be amended to make explicit that the Commission has a role in assessing fiscal sustainability. Professor Campbell Leith, another member of the Commission. Remember, these commissioners are appointed by the Cabinet Secretary himself. He said one of the main objectives of creating a fiscal commission is to ensure that there is fiscal sustainability. The committee convener, presiding <coughs> officer Kenny Gibson, in reflecting the committee's unanimous view on this, said, we believe it should assess the Scottish Government's adherence to its fiscal rules and assess the long-term sustainability of the public finances. This will further strengthen the independent scrutiny role of the Commission and reflects the view of many witnesses who have appeared before the committee. Not my words, Presiding Officer, Kenny Gibson's. So if IMF say that this is a good thing, OECD, the Fiscal Commission members themselves, the Finance Committee and numerous expert witnesses besides, I hope that the Cabinet Secretary is listening and will indeed support my Amendment 29. You moving your amendment? Which I move, Cab uh, Presiding Officer. Right. Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to uh, support Amendment 29 um, in relation to the fiscal rules and sustainability of finances. Um, as Jackie Bailey said, the committee agreed this um, in its entirety uh, in our report here. There was no dissent whatsoever. And so I therefore look forward to hearing John Mason's comments on this matter to see if he is as keen on consistency uh, in this group of amendments uh, as he was on the previous group of amendments. The agreement of the committee uh, in January backed up the committee's previous report on the fiscal framework from June of last year, where we made exactly the same recommendation. Uh, presiding officer, a day after the stage two process, the Scottish Affairs Committee at Westminster seemed to support our view as well, where they said an enhanced Scottish Fiscal Commission should monitor and report on the Scottish Government's performance against those targets, namely the fiscal targets set out. Presiding officer, the um, framework itself, uh, at section 98 and section 101, uh, talks about relying, uh, if there is a dispute, on the technical input on the dispute uh, coming from the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So if they are going to be of use in a dispute, I think they have to have as wide a remit as possible and not only produce the official forecast as they are destined to do at the moment. Um, there have been a number of changes uh, from the amendment put forward at stage two by Jackie Bailey. Um, she's removed any reference of policy objectives, which I think is the right thing to do. Uh, she has sought expert advice. She has shared it, I know as a matter of fact, at least uh, uh, I think a week ago, uh, with all members of the committee to make sure there were no technical objections to it so that we could debate purely uh, the principle. And I note previous arguments that it's the job of Parliament to assess a long-term forecast of uh, public finances. Yes, it is. But Parliament would certainly be aided in doing that job and scrutiny by having access to work done by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Um, Presiding officer, the 
uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission themselves, Jackie Bailey, read out two quotes, but in their written submission to the Finance Committee, they believed that they should have responsibility for assessing the Scottish Government's forecasts on the sustainability of Scotland's public finances, such as adherence to fiscal rules, as an example, and it would welcome the bill being amended now to anticipate this additional responsibility when it arises. Uh, Presenting officer, for all of those, re those reasons, I support Amendment 29, and I genuinely hope uh, that the Government uh, will back that amendment uh, so that we can have a fiscal commission really worth shouting about. Thank you very much. Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, I welcome the opportunity to debate further uh, Jackie Bailey's amendment, uh, which, as uh, she indicated and as Gavin Brown said, has been debated um, in a, a different form, but uh, largely a similar principle at stage two. Um, I remain unclear of the added value or enhanced scrutiny provided by way of the Commission assessing Scottish Minister's performance against fiscal rules. Um, the Scottish Government is subject to budgetary rules, which Jackie Bailey includes in her definition of fiscal rules, uh, performance against which is already effectively assessed by the Auditor General as part of the annual audit of the Scottish Government's annual financial statements. We are also subject to statutory aggregate borrowing limits and annual borrowing limits set administratively by the United Kingdom Government. There are already established mechanisms for reporting to Parliament on these issues. It is a matter of fact as to whether or not the Scottish Government operates within these limits and so it remains unclear what public value the Commission could add in carrying out assessments against these limits. Should the Scottish Government gain borrowing flexibilities in future, which would enable us to set uh, further and more flexible fiscal rules, then I would suggest that we revisit this issue and consider whether the Commission could add value in reporting on the Government's adherence to such rules. In relation to fiscal sustainability, I remain of the view that this is primarily a role for elected members of the Scottish Parliament, who hold ministers directly to account for the robustness of our financial judgments. Uh, I'll give way to uh, Mr Chisholm first. Malcolm Malcolm Chisholm. Cabinet Secretary, forgive me. But, but it, would it not be very difficult for members to do that unless they have the level of analysis from the Fiscal Commission or such like in order to have the information uh, to, to, in order to hold the government to account on that issue? My judgment is that well, there's not a lack of financial information that circulates around in relation to the setting of the budget process. They extend. Mr Chisholm and I were both former members of the House of Commons. The degree of financial scrutiny around financial provisions in this Parliament is significantly stronger and more detailed than anything I experienced in the House of Commons. There are spring and autumn budget revisions and there is all the information that is set out and the scrutiny to which we are subjected by the Auditor General and uh, in the, word, the wider role that the Auditor General uh, undertakes. So I, I, I think members of the Parliament have uh, a, a very strong access to data and information to enable them to undertake that task. I'll give way to Mr. Uh, Baroness Goldie. Animal Goldie. I was struck by his earlier comment that um, as further uh, borrowing powers, for example, uh, might emerge, he might be prepared then to come back and look at this. But is that not to concede that in principle, um, Ms. Bailey's uh, amendment is, is sensible because the whole point about the Fiscal Commission is we are creating something a very important body, which we have never had before, which I think has the attraction to many onlookers of being the first time we've had a composite umbrella body with a very important job to perform, with very important duties. And I'd have thought that the Cabinet Secretary, far from seeing this as in some way tiresome, restricting or distracting, actually a support to the very important job he is charged with doing. I am, I, at no stage did I use any of the language that Barnes Goldie has just suggested were reasons why this amendment should not be supported. I, at no stage have I used the word tiresome about the financial scrutiny. What I've said is that I believe the financial scrutiny is there by virtue of the current exercise of functions by Audit Scotland and by virtue of the fact that the fiscal rules under which I am obliged to operate, whether that is living within the revenue limit set by the United Kingdom Government, which is the, the rule in which I have to operate, or the capital Dell requirement, or a fixed borrowing limit, which will be set at 3% of the well, £450 million pounds per annum. If, you know, if, if, if we borrow 400, well, we couldn't borrow £450 million because we'd be prevented from doing so because it would breach our administrative limits. My point is that I don't see, in the, the description I said, was I could not see what the added value of this was in relation to the, amendments that was, the amendment that was being put forward by Jackie Bailey. 
So I don't think it's an appropriate role for the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And as I've indicated in my responses to interventions, risks duplicating the roles already fulfilled by the Parliament and by the Auditor General. So I therefore ask Jackie Bailey not to press her amendment, failing which I recommend to Parliament that Parliament does not support the amendment. Many thanks. Now call on Jackie Bailey to wind up and press to withdraw her amendment. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I intend to press the amendment. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has deployed some of these arguments before, so let me take them in turn. Firstly, he says that this is a role for Audit Scotland. Um, let me just read out the Auditor General's role. It's to appoint auditors to Scotland's central government and NHS bodies, to examine how public bodies spend public money, to help them to manage their finances to the highest standards, and to check whether they achieve value for money. I don't see fiscal rules or indeed sustainability of public finances in that. Now, Audit Scotland have published in, in a in a second, because Audit Scotland have published a number of reports on developing financial reporting in Scotland. They've written to the Finance Committee recently on the fiscal framework as well. They are very strong in wanting a comprehensive, transparent, reliable and timely reporting of Scotland's public finances, a key part of which is the overall account of revenues, expenditure, assets and liabilities of the Scottish public sector as a whole. Scrutinising the sustainability of public finances is something with which they agree. This is complementary to Audit Scotland's work and I am sure that as with other bodies that you know, the Cabinet Secretary has referred to when we were debating this at stage one and stage two, that a facility of a memorandum of understanding could be put in place that ensures cooperation between both bodies. I'll take an intervention now. John the, 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 the point that I'm grateful to Jackie Bailey for giving me. The point I was wanting to intervene on was the point when Jackie Bailey set out the functions of Audit Scotland. And these functions are about assessing essentially the quality of judgments that are made about financial decision making that are undertaken. And that is already part of the remit of Audit Scotland. And that's why I think this, would, this provision would duplicate that essential role. Um, really? I, don't, I don't think it's unnecessary. I don't think it provides duplication. But I've suggested to the Cabinet Secretary a way of ensuring that that doesn't happen, which is a memorandum of understanding quite commonly used with other bodies. Can I turn to the issue of the role of Parliament? Because ultimately, it is indeed always the role of Parliament to hold the executive to account. But Parliament can and should be assisted in this task. We currently benefit hugely from information from SPICE, from the Financial Scrutiny Unit, and indeed others besides. But I expect the Finance Committee and the Parliament itself to benefit hugely from the Fiscal Commission's work in the future. Malcolm Chisholm is absolutely right. We should be equipped with the financial information, the factual information, on which we can then make informed judgments and I would have thought that that's something this parliament aspires to. My final word presiding officer um, is really a reflection again about the committee. This was supported by every single member of the finance committee in their first committee report on fiscal institutions and then in the stage one report on the bill. I would be hugely disappointed if today those members change their minds. I can't ask the convener, I can't ask Mark MacDonald because they're not here. But I would genuinely be hugely disappointed if the man who has been consistent throughout this, John Mason, was to change his mind. And as has already been referred to, as already been referred to, I'll take John Mason. John Mason. Well, for the sake of completeness, seeing as she mentions me, um, I have to say this is not an issue I think is absolutely central and is I feel very strongly about. I did feel very strongly about the forecasting and as uh, John Sweeney said, I have been, I think, consistent on that. I do not, I, I, I struggle to understand the difference that this would really make. Um, you really? Well, I can simply observe that for two years you've struggled to understand what difference this would make, but you have nevertheless supported it. You supported it in the original report, you supported it in the stage one report, um, and I would have had much more respect for people um, if they had stayed consistent to that. Um, but particularly so, because as Gavin Brown said, I consulted each and every member of the Finance Committee to make sure that I was properly reflecting the committee's view. Needless to say, I didn't get a response to my email from any of the SNP members, which again is disappointing. Presiding officer, this is what fiscal institutions do. 
You know, if we want to be in line with what the rest of the world does, then we should be supporting Amendment 29. But clearly, clearly, based on what the Cabinet Secretary has said, I'm unlikely to be happy when this is voted on. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. And as this is the first division of the stage, the Parliament is suspended for five minutes.
Order. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 29 is yes, 43, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call Amendments 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, all in the name of the Deputy First Minister and all previously debated. And I invite the Deputy First Minister to move Amendments 2 to 6 on block, please. It moved on block, President. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 2 to 6? Since no member objects, the question is that Amendments 2 to 6 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. That then brings us to Group 3, Review of Accuracy of Forecasts. And I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Deputy First Minister, Group with Amendments 10, 11, 13 and 14. And I invite the Deputy First Minister to move Amendment 7 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. President Officer, the purpose of Amendment 7 is to provide a basis for scrutiny by and accountability, accountability to the Scottish Parliament in relation to the previous Commission's forecasts. I believe it is important that the forecasts that underpin the Scottish budget process are as robust as possible and informed by previous experience. The Commission will therefore Could we conduct... order in the Chamber, please? The Commission will therefore conduct a self-evaluation of its previous forecasts for each financial year. It is for the Commission to determine the content of these forecasts which may include comparisons of assumptions, risks and projections used by the Commission against the actual outturn and results. Amendments 10, 11, 13 and 14 are consequential amendments which ensure that the reports on the accuracy of previous forecasts are laid before the Parliament and published by the Commission. I move Amendment 7 and ask members to support the remaining amendments in the group at the appropriate time. Since no one has requested to speak, Deputy First Minister, do you wish to wind up? Uh, no further comments. Thank you. Question then is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendments 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 and 18. All in the name of the Deputy First Minister and all previously debated. And I invite the Deputy First Minister to move Amendments 8 to 18 on block, please. It moved on block, President Officer. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 8 to 18? Since no member has objected, the question is that Amendments 8 to 18 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. That then brings us to Group 4, Scottish Minister's Statement. And I call Amendment 19 in the name of the Deputy First Minister in a group on its own and uh, ask the Deputy First Minister to move and speak to Amendment 19, please. So the Fiscal Framework Agreement specifies that the Commission should prepare the tax and GDP forecasts which support the operation of that framework. I consider it to be equally important that we take legislative action to ensure that the Commission's forecasts have official status and to create a presumption that these are the forecasts that will inform the Scottish Budget. The intention of Amendment 19 is to ensure that Scottish Ministers are required to give account to the Scottish Parliament if they do not use the forecasts prepared by the Commission in the Scottish Budget. In such an instance, which I would expect to arise only in truly exceptional circumstances, the Scottish Ministers must make a statement to Parliament to explain the basis of any disagreement. The statement must be laid before Parliament at the same time as budget documentation. This requirement, read together with Amendments 1 and 8, will create a presumption that the Scottish Ministers will use the forecast prepared by the Commission in the Scottish Budget and requires them to report to Parliament so that the basis of the decision taken by Ministers is transparent and can be appropriately scrutinised. I move Amendment 19. Many thanks. No other member has requested to speak. Deputy First Minister, do you wish to add anything? Hey, no further comments. Mm -hmm. Many thanks. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I now call Amendments 20, 21 and 22, all in the name of the Deputy First Minister and all previously debated. And I invite the Deputy First Minister to move Amendments 20, 21 and 22 on block, please. Moved on block, President. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 20, 21 and 22? Since no member objects, the question is that Amendments 20, 21 and 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. That then brings us to Group 5, duty to cooperate with the Office for Budget Responsibility. I call Amendment 23 in the name of the Deputy First Minister in a group on its own and I invite the Deputy First Minister to move and speak to Amendment 23, please. President Officer, the purpose of Amendment 23 is to implement a requirement in the Fiscal Framework Agreement that the Scottish and United Kingdom Governments will introduce a reciprocal statutory duty of cooperation between the Commission and the Office for Budget Responsibility. 
This amendment will support the two independent bodies in discharging their statutory functions, both as they exist now and as they will be amended once the Smith proposals are fully implemented. Whilst this amendment places a duty on the Scottish Fiscal Commission only, we expect the United Kingdom Government to introduce a reciprocal arrangement through a Section 104 order under the Scotland Act 1998 order in due course. The fiscal framework anticipates that the statutory duty will be underpinned by a memorandum of understanding between the two bodies, which will set out more detailed practical working arrangements. I move Amendment 23. Many thanks, Deputy First Minister. I have no further requests to speak. Do you wish to add anything? Thank you. Thank you. The question then is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. That brings us to Group 6, Review of Commission's Performance Review Period, and I call Amendment 24. In the name of the Deputy First Minister, Group with Amendments 25, 26, 27 and 28. And I ask the Deputy First Minister to move Amendment 24 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. President Officer, these amendments bring forward the timing of the first external review of the Commission's performance, so that the first review will occur after two years of commencement of its statutory functions. After that, a review will be required at least once every five years. These measures will help ensure an early review of how the Commission is performing its functions and to provide assurance that the forecasting arrangements are robust and working well. This is particularly relevant in the early phases of the Commission's work, where there is not the same legacy of reporting and forecasts upon which the Commission can build. The Commission itself will determine the scope of the first and indeed every review. This means that there is scope to ensure that the scope of the first review is proportionate to the status and situation of the Commission at that time. There is a clear public interest in ensuring that there is an early check on the Commission's work and emerging operational and governance arrangements. By requiring the first external review after two years, we are taking additional steps to ensure that this Parliament and the people of Scotland can have confidence that the Commission's forecasts, which will underpin the Scottish Budget, are robust. I move Amendment 24. Many thanks. I have no further requests to speak. Do you wish to add anything, Deputy First Minister? Nothing, President. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendments 25, 26, 27 and 28, all in the name of the Deputy First Minister and all previously debated. And I invite the Deputy First Minister to move Amendments 25 to 28 on block, please. It moved on block, President. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 25 to 28? Since no member objects, the question is that amendments 25 to 28 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And that then ends consideration of amendments. I will allow a few moments for the Chamber to clear before we move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 15869 in the name of John Swinney on the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill. I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please. And I call on John Swinney to speak to you and move the motion, Deputy First Minister, nine minutes, please. Presiding officer, the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill will ensure there is an independent fiscal institution operating at the heart of Scotland's devolved fiscal framework. The Bill safeguards the Commission's independence, transparency and accountability to Parliament and the public, and I commend the Bill to Parliament this afternoon. The Finance Committee has devoted many hours to scrutiny of the Government's proposals for the Fiscal Commission, both prior to and during the legislative process. I am grateful to the Convener and to members of the Committee for the thoughtful consideration they have given to these issues and the challenge which they have brought to bear. This challenge has helped us to test and refine our proposals so that we can all be satisfied that the Bill delivers the strongest possible arrangements to safeguard the forecasts which support the Scottish Budget. I would also like to place on record my thanks to the individuals and organisations who took time to respond to the Government's consultation on our legislative proposals last year and to the various calls for evidence on this topic issued by the Finance Committee since 2013. These contributions have provided fresh perspectives which have helped us to guide and shape our policy. Parliament is aware that in order to secure a fair deal for Scotland on the block grant adjustment, which ensured there was no detriment to Scotland's budget, 
I agreed to uh, compromise on the production of forecasts in the fiscal framework agreement. I have previously expressed significant reservations about this forecasting model. However, I am confident that the arrangements in the Bill before Parliament this afternoon will ensure the Commission is equipped to produce robust forecasts to underpin the Scottish Budget and that Parliament can appropriately hold the Commission to account for its work. The amendments approved by Parliament this afternoon mean the Commission will prepare five-year forecasts of receipts from the fully devolved taxes, from non-domestic rates and from the Scottish rate of income tax, and that these will be prepared in time to meet the needs of the Scottish Budget process. The Commission will be required to publish an explanation of the methodology and assumptions which it applied in preparing its forecasts so that these can be scrutinised by Parliament, academic commentators and others. Furthermore, our amendments ensure that the Commission's forecasts are the official forecasts which support the Scottish Budget. The Commission's core statutory function is to prepare forecasts and assessments which inform the Scottish Budget. And I have gone further than the equivalent obligations on the UK Government by providing in statute that Scottish Ministers must make a statement to Parliament if they depart from the Commission's forecasts in preparing the Scottish Budget. This ensures that Parliament can properly hold Ministers to account for choosing such a course of action. I would anticipate that Scottish Ministers would not take such a decision lightly and that only in truly exceptional circumstances would alternative forecasts be used in a Scottish Budget. Uh, of course. Malcolm Chisholm. Can you tell us what resources the Scottish Government will have? He's obviously talking about the possibility of them rejecting a Commission uh, forecast. W will the Scottish Government have the same resources now in terms of forecasting, or will there be lesser resources? It's, it's not clear to me what the case would be. Uh, well, I, I, I intend to maintain those resources within Government to ensure that we can satisfy ourselves that we have a forecast from the Fiscal Commission that we believe to be credible and deliverable uh, to underpin the Scottish Budget. Um, the, the timing of commencement of forecasting responsibilities is still to be discussed and agreed with the Fiscal Commission. I want us to be in a position whereby the Commission can exercise its full forecasting responsibilities as early as possible. But it is important to allow the Commission time to put robust resourcing and operational arrangements in place so that the Government and Parliament can be assured over the integrity of the forecast underpinning the Scottish Budget. I have every confidence that the Chair and members of the Commission will do just that as they oversee the transition to a statutory body. Um, but, that, uh, but I place on record the fact that uh, we will need to um, agree those uh, transition arrangements with the Fiscal Commission to ensure that we have robust forecasts to underpin the Scottish Budget. This Parliament currently has competence to legislate for a Fiscal Commission with functions related to the tax and borrowing powers devolved by the Scotland Acts of 1998 and 2012. Once the current Scotland Bill has been enacted, we will be able to move quickly to expand the functions of the Commission in accordance with the Fiscal Framework Agreement. We plan to use the regulation making, the regulation making powers on the Bill to require the Commission to also produce forecasts of devolved demand-led Social Security expenditure and Scottish GDP, as well as modifying the existing function in relation to income tax to reflect the wider powers due for devolution in 2017. The Government has brought forward amendments which not only deliver the changes in statutory functions necessary to fulfil my obligations under the Fiscal Framework Agreement, but which build in additional safeguards to strengthen the scrutiny and accountability arrangements which underpin a forecast preparation model. I have already referred to the requirement on the Commission to publish details of its forecasting methodology, as the Scottish Government has done for the past two years. In addition, the Commission will be required to prepare a report evaluating the accuracy of its previous forecasts, providing transparency over the past precision and accuracy of its te technical analysis. The Commission will also be subject to an external review of its performance two years after the commencement of its statutory functions. This recognises the strong public interest in ensuring that the forecasting arrangements which underpin the Scottish Budget and the operation of our new fiscal framework are operating effectively and, su and supported by robust institutional governance arrangements. All of these reviews and reports must be laid before Parliament, providing additional tools by which Parliament can hold the Commission to account. I also want to ensure that we retain a form of the challenge function currently carried out by the non-statutory Commission, and which I believe has greatly enhanced the, the Government's forecasting abilities. I envisage that forecasts will be prepared in future by a professional group of staff appointed by the Commission, and these forecasts will in turn be scrutinised by members of the Commission. I have shared this view with members of the Commission who will determine how forecasts will be produced and what quality assurance processes are required to vouchsafe the integrity of these forecasts. 
At introduction, the bill delivered a Scottish Fiscal Commission, which was structurally, operationally and visibly independent of government. Independence has been a key feature of our proposals for the Commission, with Audit Scotland commenting that the consultation paper, which we published uh, almost a year ago on the 26th of March 2015, rightly identifies the independence and impartiality of the Commission as being of paramount importance and sets out proposals to achieve this. The Bill expressly provides that the Commission will not be the subject of direction or control of any member of the Scottish Government in performing its functions guaranteeing its operational independence. The amendment which I brought forward at Stage 2 to require the Commission and the Government to agree and publish a protocol delivers greater transparency in the interaction between the Commission and Scottish Ministers. The Commission will retain the flexibility to determine its own work programme within the scope of devolved fiscal powers, enhancing its operational independence. The Commission will rightly be directly accountable to Parliament for the discharge of its functions, and Parliament will have a key role in approving the appointment of members of the Commission. In light of issues raised by the Finance Committee in its Stage 1 report, I brought forward amendments at Stage 2 which allow members of the Commission to be appointed to serve a second consecutive term of office and which specify that an appointment term will be a maximum of five years. Everybody across the Chamber should welcome the creation of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. It demonstrates how seriously we are committed to establishing robust forecasting arrangements to support the operation of new tax and borrowing powers. The continuation of the Scottish Fiscal Commission as a statutory body is another important milestone in the journey to enhance Scotland's fiscal powers. The Commission already plays a key role in supporting the exercise of the tax powers devolved under the Scotland Acts of 1998 and 2012. And this bill provides for an institutional and operational framework which enhances that role, protects the Commission's independence and creates a solid basis for the Commission to expand its, its functions over time in line with the fiscal powers of this Parliament. I move that Parliament agrees the Fiscal Commission Bill be passed this afternoon. Many thanks. I now call on Jackie Bailey. Maximum six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I very much welcome the opportunity to participate in the Stage 3 debate of the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill. At the outset, I want to thank my colleagues on the Finance Committee, the clerks, all those that gave evidence to the committee, and indeed I want to acknowledge the role of George Osborne, the Tory Chancellor, for apparently it was he who convinced the Cabinet Secretary to make the Fiscal <coughs> Commission more robust. It was, of course, in January 2015 that Scottish Labour set out our plans for a Scottish Office of Budget Responsibility, a truly independent body, one with teeth, that would ensure that we have greater transparency and scrutiny of Scotland's public finances. And its importance cannot be overstated, because we do have substantial new powers coming over taxation and welfare. No longer will it be just about spending money that somebody else has given us. We're now responsible for raising some of it too. So being honest and open with the Scottish people about what the economic future holds, placing forecasting in the hands of experts free of political manipulation is absolutely the right thing for us to do. And of course that applies to all governments of whatever political colour. Because let's look at the context that we face. At stage one I pointed to oil for the first time in a decade down below $30 a barrel. GDP growth figures clearly affected in a negative way. Growth in Scotland, both onshore and offshore, not good and certainly not performing as well as the rest of the UK. And just yesterday, the JERS figures were published. I understand from James Kelly, not once, not twice, but indeed three times, because the figures provided by the Scottish Government were incorrect. And I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary regrets that, but I think he will also acknowledge that that doesn't fill people with confidence. And JES, which is the Scottish Government's balance sheet, tells us that there is a staggering £15 billion gap in our public finances. That's more than the funding, Presiding Officer, for the entirety of the NHS. So, Presiding Officer, when Labour called for a Scottish OBR, the existing Fiscal Commission had a limited role. No forecasting responsibility, members appointed by the Cabinet Secretary, serving as both advisers at the same time as providing scrutiny, did not provide reassurance about the independence of the Commission. So I'm very, very pleased that that has now changed. The Fiscal Commission, now to be on a statutory footing, responsible for the official forecast, for assessing expenditure and income across the Scottish Government's responsibilities with better governance arrangements than we had before. 
I am, I confess, disappointed that the Cabinet Secretary has rejected my amendment on scrutiny of fiscal rules and the sustainability of public finances. I do regret that he and his party have turned their face against making sure that the Fiscal Commission is truly robust. Having these responsibilities is the normal stuff of fiscal institutions across the world. But hey, it's not to be that in Scotland. And yet this is, or at least it certainly was, presiding officer, something that SNP members on the Finance Committee agreed with. And can I just point out that I was delighted to see for a couple of seconds both Kenny Gibson and Mark MacDonald make their way to the chamber to vote against my amendment, something they've believed in for more than two years, but of course they've left again. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's to hide their embarrassment. The Finance Committee previously produced a much welcomed report on the need for a robust fiscal institution. This was followed by an equally thoughtful and robust stage one report. In both, only one member dissented from the Commission producing the official forecast, and as I said earlier, that was John Mason. I do respect his consistency on that issue, even if I disagree with him. But I do regret his subsequent lack of consistency in other areas of the committee's um, thinking. But what genuinely disappoints me is that other members in the convener changed their minds at the 11th hour just before stage two. Lo and behold, presiding officer, days later, before the fiscal framework was announced, they changed their minds again. Official forecasting was now to be the responsibility of the Fiscal Commission. And when it comes to the Commission scrutinising fiscal rules or considering fiscal sustainability, they all agreed. But now they've changed their minds. The Cabinet Secretary had clearly marched his SNP members up to the top of the hill and promptly abandoned them there. Now he says he didn't influence them. He says he didn't tell them about the fiscal framework negotiations. Well, you know, I ask people to think about, they've held a view, a consistent view, a strongly expressed view for two years, and then remarkably they changed their mind at the 11th hour. I don't know what happened, presiding officer. But can I say, it is a matter for individual members to determine how they protect their own credibility as politicians. But I do care about the credibility of the committee. The flip-flopping was embarrassing. It did no credit to the committee. It did no credit <coughs> to this parliament. And I hope we can all reflect on that for the future. Presiding officer, Scotland is on the verge of gaining substantial new powers. With those new powers come new responsibilities. We need openness and transparency in the stewardship of the nation's finances and the Scottish Fiscal Commission will be a very welcome addition to that process. We support the bill at stage three. Thank you. I now call in Gavin Brown. Four minutes, please, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I uh, want to begin on a positive note by saying that the bill that we now have, the bill that uh, I hope will pass today at decision time, is considerably better than the bill that was drafted prior to stage one. My own view was that the bill from stage one had a number of flaws. First of all, allowing only the Scottish Government to do the forecasts, not even really encouraging any alternative forecasts to be published, along with the Cabinet Secretary making clear his view that there ought not to be any alternative forecasts. We had a position where the Fiscal Commission was simply to um, assess the reasonableness of the Scottish Government forecasts. And in looking through that over the course of this budget process, the reasonableness test was such a low bar that it was difficult to foresee a situation where they would do anything other than pass the Government's forecasts as reasonable. When quizzed on would there be any numbers at all uh, that they could suggest that would be deemed to be unreasonable, they were unable to say so. And they stated quite bluntly that they didn't look at the numbers. They didn't look at the outputs at all. They looked at the models underpinning those numbers. So I welcome hugely, I welcome hugely the amendments that were passed in group one uh, of the process earlier today, because I think they were absolutely fundamental. Without them, I genuinely think we wouldn't have had a fiscal commission worthy of the name. 
Without them, what I think we would have had is a series of educated, useful, intelligent advisors who would make the budget process better than without them, but it would be nowhere close to what is known internationally as an independent fiscal institution. So that change, I think, really rescued the bill from what would otherwise have still have been perhaps a little helpful, um, but of almost no real regard in terms of scrutiny, particularly for the powers uh, that will be coming forward in the years to come. So it is a huge improvement, and obviously for that reason, uh, we will continue to support the bill and vote for it at stage three. But I have to say, in all honesty to the Cabinet Secretary, after uh, working on this for uh, well over two years now, I am left with just a bit of a feeling of dissatisfaction at the end of the process for, I guess, a number of the reasons that Jackie Bailey uh, outlined in her contribution, but I guess I've just been uh, working on it on that committee for uh, a, lot, a couple of years extra um, and taking into account um, a huge amount of evidence uh, over the process. So I'm disappointed um, that we don't have an amendment in there to look at the sustainability of the finances and to look at the adherence to the fiscal rules, because that seems to happen all over the OECD. When looking at the contribution from SPICE, who uh, got a document from the OECD with looking at 17 countries, um, all 17 of them do one or the other. All 17 of them look at either the long-term sustainability or the monitoring of fiscal rules, and nine out of the 17 do both. So I think the fact that we will do neither makes us a bit of an outlier. Presiding officer, I was dissatisfied too with the at stage two of the Finance Committee report, and I will return to this in, in closing. But I, in, in attempting to be helpful and answer a question for me, the Cabinet Secretary for me has just opened up uh, more questions. Because at stage one, we all agreed, um, without any uh, debate or without any, uh, anyone uh, going away from it in relation to fiscal rules, we all thought that was the way that we had to go. And we'd held that position uh, for well over a year. But then all of a sudden, when it came down to stage two, uh, four members of the Finance Committee uh, voted against that amendment and the amendment failed. And I ask simply, if uh, the Cabinet Secretary didn't attempt to put any pressure on them at all, and if the confidentiality was maintained, as, as, as he said, I have no reason to doubt him whatsoever in that, what was it that made them change their mind? What was the intervening evidence between that report being published in the middle of January and the vote being taken in early February that made them vote the way we did. I do think that as a committee member, and I do think as a parliament, we are entitled to an explanation of why that was the case. And I just hope we get that uh, over the course of the debate. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the short open debate, and I call John Mason to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Speeches of four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And uh, I'm very happy to speak in uh, today's debate. Uh, I very much welcome the fact that we have a fiscal commission in place and we are going to have a strengthened fiscal commission in place, and through this bill, it is going to be put on a statutory footing. As has been said by other members, we've spent a fair bit of time in the Finance Committee examining and discussing such commissions and how they work, as well as being the lead committee, actually, when the bill it, went through its process. While Scotland aspires to be an independent country at some point, with all of the extra powers and responsibilities that that involves, we are clearly not at that point yet. And in fact, internationally, there are not that many examples of devolved administrations or states in a federal system which have their own independent fiscal institutions. I think some of the US states do, Ontario does, and Catalonia, but not very many others. So we've tended to look at smaller independent countries as models, and some of the committee went to Sweden, and a couple of us went to Ireland. Therefore, in the first place, Scotland has the opportunity, I believe, to set an example and really to be leading the way for devolved governments and parliaments in having such an institution or commission. Now, as we studied more of these international examples, and as we thought through how a commission would work, I became increasingly convinced that the normal international model of an independent commission commenting on or endorsing forecasts was the best model. That is the norm internationally. The UK is an exception. So in that respect, I agreed with the government and disagreed with the majority of the committee. In fact, the Commission members themselves were not convinced by the OBR model, 
Uh, and I have to say, I do have a huge respect for all three of the Commission members, uh, and I do very much hope they will be able and willing uh, to take on the different role from the one they had actually uh, expected. However, as part of the negotiations over the fiscal framework, <coughs> I accept that Westminster was keen to have us adopt their OBR model, and I accept that the Scottish Government agreed uh, to that as part of the bargaining process. That was obviously the main area of disagreement at committee. Now, there has been mention uh, today of the one amendment we had at stage three. And I have to say, I think uh, there's a bit of tokenism going on here. Uh, I think Labour, as the opposition, uh, trying to fight off the Tories, are trying to show that they must oppose something. And they hunted through the bill and they found a little thing and they created an amendment on that. Uh, if I've got time, yes, so. Jack Bailey. This is something that you've believed in for more than two years now. It's not about hunting for something to disagree with. It's about making sure we have a robust fiscal commission that is worthy of this parliament. John Mason. I, I think we have that. I mean, as, as I've said, I think a major issue is who do, does the forecasting. But I think today's amendment is on a very peripheral issue, which really I find, it, I find it very hard to get excited about. I don't actually believe that Jackie Bailey is excited about it. I think she is uh, just making a bit of a mountain uh, out of a molehill. Now, independence for the Scottish Fiscal Commission was one topic we all agreed was essential. Now, partly that comes from because uh, of having appropriate structures, but I remain convinced that the other essential element is the integrity and the independence of the individuals involved. And in that respect, forecasting and independence are two distinct concepts. And it really does not affect the independence of the Fiscal Commission, whether they are doing the forecasting or not. And we have the good example of Audit Scotland, eh, who check other people's work and comment on it, and are hugely eh, respected. And in that eh, aspect, I mean, I do find Amendment 7 today has, is a slightly strange amendment. I have voted for it. Um, but it talks about the Commission eh, eh, preparing reports, containing an assessment of the accuracy of its forecasts prepared by it. And so we have been forced into this slightly odd position that the Commission is having to comment on its own forecasts. Do I have to close, please? Uh, right, just on the cost, I think we've been very generous so far with the Fiscal Commission at £850,000. That is more than the Irish or the Swedes get. Uh, and I do not think we should be throwing more money at them without a lot of caution. Uh, but I do uh, very much welcome the fact we're going to have this Scottish Fiscal Commission and I very hope, much hope that members will support it at decision time. Thank you. Many thanks. Now I call Malcolm Chisholm. Members have explained this has been a long and twisting road and I'm afraid I haven't been able to follow every turn since I'm not on the Finance Committee, but I am pleased uh, at the destination that we've arrived at. I mean, when the model was, the original model was proposed, I had two worries about it. First, although the theory was that we would have uh, the, uh, the, the government forecast, which the uh, uh, Commission would then um, comment on, it seemed to be that the, the, the SFC was acting uh, much more as advisors to the government and there was constant interaction uh, during the process, which may have meant that they had influence, but it also reduced their independence. So I think that was a flaw in the model. But the more fundamental flaw, of course, was that they were not involved in the forecast at all. And we're told that there's not a single fiscal commission anywhere that only looks at official government forecasts. So that needed to be uh, sorted out. David Bell gave a quite an interesting quote about why this was necessary. I said, uh, I think it is essential that the forecasting is done outside government. Then you will know if they are wrong, which is probably going to be true, they will be honestly wrong rather than dishonest wrong and I suppose a more neutral way of putting that is governments tend to uh, indulge in optimism bias so I'm pleased that we've got uh, a, an enhanced role now for the Commission it's going to be reviewed that's good there can also be exter external valuation of their work and they can we can have a mechanism perhaps to have external valuation through local or international uh, experts as is recommended by the OECD but I am slightly worried beyond that about uh, the perhaps overemphasis on checking that we're still hearing from the Cabinet Secretary. I may have this wrong, but it seems to me that there's going to be certain forecasts are appointed and the FSC 
uh, members are going to check them. So that seems to me to be rather over-engineered. And then I was slightly surprised to hear that the Scottish Government is going to have the same forecasting capacity that it currently has, checking the SFC. So I was slightly surprised about all this checking going on. And I think that does depart from the OBR uh, model. And so I think we need to keep a watch on that. And one reason, of course, to keep a watch on is it's going to have increased expenditure. Because if you've got all that capacity still in the Scottish Government and obviously extra capacity in the SFC, then that will have financial implications. Anyway, uh, obviously um, tax is going to be critical for this, but they will also have a role, I think, in terms of the new uh, social security powers. I think the main issue that could be controversial in the next five years between the two governments relates to the spillover effects. And I think the Cabinet Secretary uh, pointed out at one or other of his committee appearances that um, the information from the OBR and FSC would be helpful in resolving any uh, controversies in that particular area. Now, John Mason said he uh, is not excited about Jackie Bailey's uh, amendment, and he, he, he claims that none of us are. But it's actually a very important uh, amendment that Jackie Bailey put forward, and I hope this will be revisited in due course. Many European countries have one or other of the responsibilities referred to, and I'm particularly interested in an assessment of the long-term sustainability of the public finances. That is not one of the functions of Audit Scotland, to look five years ahead, projecting what we know about um, policies and tax and project that forward five years and the cabinet secretary says I and everybody else can can hold him to account on that we can't we do not have that information unless we have experts projecting forward as the OBR does over uh, five uh, years and I think this is one of the problems that there's almost a prejudice against the OBR among certain members of this but I think the OBR uh, it does produce good reports on financial sustainability looking five years ahead and I don't see why the Scottish Fiscal Commission shouldn't do uh, uh, perform the same uh, function. So while I welcome the changes that have been made in the bill, I hope this is not the end uh, of the process. I'm sure members who are coming back will keep a close watch from inside, and I and no doubt Gavin Brown will keep a close watch from outside. Thank you very much. We now turn to the closing speeches, and I understand this will be Gavin Brown's last speech. So on behalf of the presiding officers, can I thank you for your contribution to the Parliament and wish you all the best for the future. Gavin Brown. Uh, presenting officer, I didn't realise until now that this is going to be my last speech. So, uh, uh, so you obviously uh, uh, know something that uh, that I don't, and uh, indeed the uh, the whip in this parliament must move in very mysterious ways. So, um, I just hope I uh, don't get dragged into anything next week, uh, or indeed uh, the week after. Um, this has been a, a, clearly a very short debate, summing up uh, just a handful of uh, interim speeches since I last spoke uh, is always a difficult job. But I think the starting point has to be, look, all of us, I think, want to see uh, this bill to pass today. And as I said in my introduction, it's considerably better uh, than it was at the start. And for that reason alone, I think it deserves uh, the entire support of the Parliament. If you look at the genesis of uh, fiscal commissions uh, across the world, why, why did they come about? Why do they come about? In almost all cases, uh, the reason why it came about uh, to start with was because there was a big recession there was a downturn that wasn't predicted. There was a downturn that turned out to be uh, demonstrably worse than anyone had predicted. And all of this uh, was driven by optimism bias uh, from government. So government after government has set up a fiscal commission in order to make sure that we manage uh, the pence and the pounds, to make sure that we minimize or indeed eradicate optimism bias and to get independent expertise uh, along with a set of checks and balances. And that is one of the reasons why I think we're doing it now, coupled with the fact that we already have some financial powers and we're getting considerably more. And if you only have uh, financial powers looking at, for example, LBTT, if you get it slightly wrong, you can quite often find a way of accommodating that change to make sure it doesn't impact on the services that you can provide. But once we move into income tax, once we move into looking carefully at non-domestic rates, once we move into a portion of ultimately VAT, um, with the greater number of powers we have, the greater the risk is for getting it wrong. And if we get it wrong at the forecast stage, particularly in predicting uh, that we're going to get more than we actually get, then we have serious problems in relation to the Scottish budget in making sure we can then uh, correct those errors 
uh, going forward over the course of the year. So for that reason, the Fiscal Commission becomes uh, even more important, and it's a reason, I think, for all of us uh, backing it today. In terms of the debate, I do just want to, uh, to pick up on, I think, the one key point of that debate, because uh, John Mason, a man who I respect hugely, who I think has done a very good job as Deputy Convener, I think is just simply wrong when he says that the issue was tokenism. I think the amendment today reflected, in my opinion, the second most important thing that the committee reviewed and looked at. Issue number one for me, far and above the rest, was indeed the forecasting. But issue number two was having a responsibility uh, for the long-term sustainability of the finances and for making sure the fiscal rules were adhered to. So suggest, to suggest it is tokenism, I think is just incorrect. If you look again at the OECD principles, principle 3.1 outlines the kind of functions that the fiscal commissions ought to have. They look at economic and fiscal projections. They look at baseline projections. They look at analysis of the executive's budget. They monitor compliance with fiscal rules or official targets. So in terms of the main things that any, any fiscal commission anywhere on the planet does, this is one of them. This is one of the key things they have to do. It's something the committee thought they had to do all the way through. It's something that I hope Mr. Swinney in rejecting it today can at least keep the door open. Because as our powers increase, as we become a stronger uh, fiscal parliament, it's critical that we get that right. And we need somebody other than government to keep control there. It doesn't just mean it's better for the country. It actually helps Mr. Swinney or his successor to do their job even better as well. And for that reason, I hope we ultimately do get that in the Fiscal Commission. And I'm happy to close there. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call in Dr. Richard Simpson. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I've come late to this. I uh, haven't served on the committee, but I've watched some of the uh, ambulations of the committee over, over the period of time. Uh, and I think, you know, we've reached a point which is on the whole a, a very good one. And it's, uh, uh, this bill will be supported tonight uh, unanimously, I'm sure. I mean, there is the international recognition that inst uh, independent fiscal institutions do play a vital role in supporting the operation of a country's fiscal framework. And there's been a rapid growth in the number of such institutions over the last decade, particularly, as Gavin, said, since the, uh, Gavin Brown said, since the 2008 uh, financial crisis. But prediction is a difficult game. I mean, who would have known the oil price would today would have been what it is? Certainly the government weren't able to predict that, and I don't blame them altogether for it. Those, their comments on the jurors today as not being relevant seem to be extraordinary. However, um, we, we've, we've no argument with placing the Fiscal Commission on a statutory basis. This is a significant improvement on the basis of it was before when it was helpful, useful, but was essentially an advisor to the government. The vexed questions which were facing us, I think, today um, have been only half resolved. The, the first one, of course, is the question of uh, the, um, producing the macroeconomic forecasts. And uh, the Deputy First Minister called it a winding road, and it certainly has been. But the resolution is in line, at least, with the original view of the committee on this issue, although the SNP members, as we've heard, uh, ha have latterly uh, have been following the Deputy First Minister rather like the Duke of York up and down the hills, except in his case, he abandoned them at the top, as, as Jackie said. The, the IMF, in evidence, said the Scottish Fiscal Commission could contribute to the credibility of the government's fiscal policy by assessing the realism of the Scottish government's forecast, but actually having independent forecasts is a much better way of doing it. But they are to have their own forecasts, so we will watch with interest, in my case from afar, to see if those forecasts actually do match. And of course, we hope we have got the very welcome amendment today that if they don't match, the government will have to give Parliament an explanation. I think the important thing is that these are five-year rolling uh, forecasts. And that, I think, is critical because we, we've had, I think, in the whole of the period of the Parliament, perhaps we haven't had the necessity for it, but we haven't really looked far ahead. And Audit Scotland have repeatedly said that all our institutions fail to look ahead. They look on an annual basis. They're still trying to balance the books at the end of a year. And this is not the way we need to run the country, particularly when we go through huge changes uh, as we are in health with health and social integration. That will take five to ten years. Balancing the books on a, an annual basis is going to be difficult. Now, the OECD talk about nine principles, local ownership, independence and non-partnership, 
partisanship, mandate, resources, relationship with the legislature, access to information, transparency, communications, external evaluation. And again, Gavin Brown gave us some of the additional uh, uh, wealth of information behind those. And I think many of these have been met. But the one that hasn't been met as a result of the rejection of what John Mason described quite extraordinarily as tokenism, and I don't understand that because there's been a consistency over time on this issue, uh, is the question of measuring the performance against fiscal rules and sustainability. This does seem to me to be the bit that's now missing. Uh, and I think it's a great pity that we're not, going to, we're, not, we're not going to have that. And to say that Audit Scotland would do this, I think is just quite inappropriate. Audit, it's not Audit Scotland Co. I've got a great time for Audit Scotland. They've been hugely valuable, as uh, Mary Scannell and I said in committee the other day, enormously important contribution they've made. But that's not the contribution that they are making. They, they, but they, I, I do welcome that despite the contortions of the SNP members on this issue as well, which have been quite revealing in terms of how our committee structure has worked in this, in this parliament, but, but at least the Deputy First Minister, if I understand him correctly, has agreed to re-examine this, particularly if we get greater flexibility in setting our own fiscal rules. And I think that that at least is to be welcome. I would very much welcome the changes to the appointment system. Some might want to go further and have hearings on the chair before they're appointed. I would certainly favour that, but, but the Finance Committee at least will be able to call members in evidence. I think the reciprocal arrangements for cooperation between the, finance, the Commission and the OBR is welcome. Um, and the external valuation, although there's lacking in detail on this, I think, it, again, that, that that's important. I think I'd make one final plea, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Ever since the Parliament has started, there's been a lack of strategic clarity and transparency in the budget process over a period of time. I don't deny the books have been balanced, and that's great. But nevertheless, it's looking ahead, as Audit Scotland has said and I mentioned earlier. I think it's this long-term view of where we're actually going to go that is really important. And I hope that some of the discussions we had in that opening session about Oregon and how it worked and how well it worked might be, might be reflected in where we go in future. So 17 years on, there are so many issues on which we've had no progress. Health inequality, child poverty, although there was initial progress, in fact, said by the OECD to be amongst the fastest they'd ever seen <coughs> as going backwards. Homeless target has not been met. There are so many social objectives that we need to meet and it has to be done within an overall framework which I think we will partially have tonight and I hope eventually have in full measure. I, I will be supporting the bill as I, my party will tonight. Many thanks. I now call on John Swinney to wind up. Seven minutes, please, Deputy First Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me begin with one of the comments that uh, Malcolm Chisholm made about uh, his concern about the fact that the government would maintain its capacity to undertake the tax forecasting um, responsibility, and, well, not responsibility, that, that function to enable us to be informed about uh, whether or not we could come to a view that we accept the estimates made by the Scottish Fiscal Commission. I think that's a an elementary proposition. I think the government would be in dereliction of its duty if it wasn't actually undertaking that assessment to satisfy itself that a body not accountable to government, accountable to parliament, I concede, is able to formulate an, a set of numbers that will be so significantly influential on the public finances of Scotland that the government will not want to be assured that that commission has come to the correct judgment and proposition or the correct range of functions because those members are absolutely right that there's not a precision about these points but we certainly need to satisfy ourselves that the estimates that are and the forecasts that have been put forward are uh, appropriate and dependable for the pur purposes of the Scottish budget process and the arrangements that we've put in place whereby if the government decides that these forecasts do not command the confidence of the government the government is able, as and it's a part of the OBR framework as well, the OBR can be challenged by the UK government if the UK government doesn't believe the forecast put forward by the OBR, that there is a mechanism that enables the government to undertake that approach. And I think that is absolutely correct uh, to enable the government to properly exercise its responsibilities for financial management to the people of Scotland. Now, Richard Simpson, um, set out some arguments about the international evidence of external forecasting. And actually, um, if Mr. Simpson, Dr. Simpson was to look at the analysis undertaken by SPICE, he would find that the OBR model is actually the outlier. And Robert Choate, 
um, made that point when he came to give evidence to the Finance Committee that the OBR was the, the model that was not the norm. Uh, now, of course, as part of the negotiation of the fiscal framework, I've accepted a, a proposition which is closer to that model. And if that matters to the United Kingdom government to get them to agree a reasonable fiscal framework, then you know, I'm, the, I'm prepared to agree that, to get us into that position. But I think when we're taking this, coming to this considered judgment about it, we have to bear in mind the fact that the, government's, the Scottish government's position uh, to begin with in this debate was founded in a very strong body of international evidence that indicated that the approach we were taking was a robust approach which would fulfil the function that was envisaged of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Now, in the course of the debate, there's been a lot of discussion about the amendment that Jackie Bailey put forward today. And Gavin Brown indicated that there were two functions that he thought were it had to be observed as a consequence, or should have been observed as a consequence of that amendment. The, the, there was clarity about the responsibility for the long-term sustainability of the public finances. And secondly, that the government was observing its financial rules. Well, on the latter, on observing the financial rules, my problem with a lot of what was put forward in the amendment debate is that the question of whether the government is observing its financial rules are, are, are entirely black and white questions. They are matters of fact, as I explained to Barnes Goldie in response to her intervention earlier on. And then on the question of where does responsibility lie for the long-term sustainability of the public finances, uh, that, will, that judgment ultimately, in my view, rests with members of parliament, informed, yes, by the consideration of the finance committee, informed very significantly by the judgments of the Finance Secretary, uh, but ultimately that is the responsibility of Parliament to determine whether or not members of Parliament believe the public finances to be uh, undertaken on a sustainable basis. Of course, I'll give you... Gavin Brown. I'm, I'm grateful to him. Of course it falls to Parliament, but as time and time we've heard again, members of Parliament will be aided by the analysis of the SFC. We will do our job better as parliamentarians and looking at the public finances if we have the analysis from the SFC. Yeah, well, that, that, that's, that's a matter of opinion in which Mr Brown and I are going to have to disagree because I think there is plenty of information and plenty of analysis that is available that will enable Parliament to form that judgment, which is ultimately, ultimately a judgment for elected members of Parliament. It is not a judgment for people appointed by Parliament on its behalf. It is a responsibility that we all should take very seriously as elected members of Parliament. Now, I hate to close my speech tonight on a discordant note with Mr Brown, because it is, of course, uh, it is, of course, Mr Brown's... Well, I, well I, the, the presiding officer has informed us it's Mr Brown's final speech to Parliament. It seemed to take Mr Brown by surprise that it was his own <laughs> speech. But I can advise them that the source of that information was, in fact, the Conservative Chief Whip. So uh, oh. uh, that's the. So maybe Mr. Brown will take a message from that uh, uh, fr from that revelation. But I want to say, I want to share with Parliament a, a, a little a story about Mr. Brown, where I um, I was on my summer holidays last year, escaping from it all waiting in the queue to get on the ferry at Oban for my summer retreat to the Argyll Islands, so magnificently represented by Mr Russell in this parliament. And as I pulled up my car to join the queue for the ferry to Mull, who was in the car next door but Mr Gavin Brown and his family. So it was a real get away from it all break for the Swinney family. Uh, but I want to say to Mr Brown, he has been a, a, a a creditable and commendable um, adversary for me in this parliament, but also a friend in this parliament, and I commend him on his distinguished contribution to parliament. Uh, parliament will be the poorer for, his non, uh, for his not being a member of the parliament after the election, and if I may give some private advice to the Conservative Party, it will be significantly weaker for not having Mr Brown in its ranks. But I thank Mr Brown for his uh, con contribution to Parliament. <laughs> if Jamie McGregor will forgive me, I'm going to have to bring my remarks to a close. Mr Brown has not, been, has not always been my strongest ally 
in all that I have brought to Parliament, but I thank him for his distinguished contribution to Parliament. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Scottish Fiscal Commission. We now move to the next item of business, and I am minded at this stage to accept a motion without notice from Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, bringing forward decision time to now. Moved. Thank you. I now put the question. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Let's go to decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 15870, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on the Lobbying Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Lobbying Scotland Bill is passed. The next question is at motion number 15869, in the name of John Swinney, on the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill is passed. <laughs> that concludes decision time, and I now close this meeting. <laughs>